The biggest shift that I'd say that I made like across prep is getting better at fatigue management and finding ways to create the same deficit with less fatigue and less perception of effort. My mistake was that I still had the powerless mentality of point A to point B. There was no like thought of like what comes between. Training the art and the skill of the competing rather than just yeah. get, getting them in the shape to do it. Because now at this point, I'm just getting to maintain muscle. To start with, because the last, I look at your notes last, right? So I'm listening to the podcast and all this other stuff, then I look at the notes. And um, the powerlifting thing, I didn't know until I looked at the notes, right? So it was eight years. Is that right? Yeah. Tell well, me I mean, thanks for, thanks for having us on. Yeah. And uh, this is super nostalgic for me because I did start in powerlifting yeah. and trying to find information. Uh, this, now, this is 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Like, where do you learn about powerlifting? It's just like when you go to the powerlift to meet, you swap talk. You're like, oh, mm -hmm. this is what the, you know, whoever's doing. And uh, then started coming across elite FTS articles. Mm -hmm. And that's where I started diving in. And I was, before we even jumped on, I was telling Renee, like, uh, one of the guys I trained with faxed me. So this is when you have faxed <laughs> yeah, okay. he, he faxed me like a that. West Side conjugate method. You know, um, it was like a 10 page thing. A guy, we're like, oh, this is our new mm -hmm. training Bible we're going to go by. So, uh, yeah. So I've been following like the lead FTS articles for a long time. Yeah. And that eventually translated into seeing like Justin Harris and Shelby Starnes and these guys educating through mm -hmm. here. So that was my first introduction into bodybuilding. So mm -hmm. cool to be here. No, that's great. Least. That's great. The facts thing cracks me up because i kind of forgot about that yeah i used to have to say when, when some of the vendors i had that were drop shippers i'd have to like fax you know the and i'd get orders that way so when the, i'd hear that noise right. know, I get, <laughs> even now if i hear that noise i'm like yeah because that always meant one thing it was an order it was an order coming through yeah that's that's that loud screechy type of thing and then tick, tick, tick. <laughs> there's some money yeah so how'd you get into the powerlifting? Like probably most kids, different sports I played and um, got into weight training and middle school and then like early in football, everyone's like testing their bench, right? Mm -hmm. Different positions. I was a safety and I always had the second highest bench in our football team. I'm like 135 pounds. I'm like, I'm really good at this lifting thing. And I like that <laughs> more than getting on the field. When, when did that happen? Like what? The junior year, like that was my freshman year. In freshman high year, yeah. I started lifting in sixth grade. Bodybuilder neighbor gave me his weight set, and I loved it. Loved lifting. Are you old enough that that was a plastic set? <laughs> it no, no, but it was like the standard barbell with yeah. the screw on. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, that, yeah. You know, they're like gold plates. He'd make your hands were like filthy by the end of mm -hmm. using them. But um, I got trapped on the bar a few times. In my dad's like upstairs work shed just because <laughs> it was the the rack that wasn't too narrow. Yeah, oh, so yeah. if you yeah. put too much weight, it's just gonna flip mm -hmm. over. But I have to roll it down off mm -hmm. me. So I basically did bench press and bicep curls for a few years before yeah. i had any sense yeah. or, the yeah. one and only yeah. foundational Pieces. program <laughs> right. yeah but it was early on that the training was more of a passion for you than football and sports and oh stuff yeah like that. yeah i just you know we start off it's all about vanity you just want to get big and jacked and look you know like mm -hmm. look the part so uh but the the strength piece was like the natural one that stood out for me and once i started realizing that more in, in high school seeing that differentiation and in texas where we're from like i went to my buddy's school in east texas and they actually had a powerlifting team yeah I'm like this is a thing like <laughs> oh man okay <laughs> like I, wait, yeah like you know it's yeah. all about this is football. a sport yeah i get it so yeah, yeah. we you maybe had wrestling on mm -hmm. the east coast north and um we had some wrestling mats the football coaches pulled those out but in, in south texas they do have powerlifting in high mm -hmm. school so i found some guys locally that were doing it they're like in their 40s and my my old bodybuilding mm -hmm. neighbor took me down to Joe's gym and we met these power lifters. I'm like, these guys are monstrous. Mm -hmm. Like it was a whole nother world. Cause you're kind of like the bigger dog in high school, right? Like mm -hmm. got the big bench press, like, all right. Oh, yeah. Then it's a whole nother world. Like, okay. um, and so these guys had some world records in powerlifting already. They're benching like in the, the 600s. I'm like, the, what is going on? So mm -hmm. that's uh, when I started bridging into it. Just by my sophomore year, I was trekking down 30 minutes just to train with these guys. And they were doing a lot of bench only meets. So they weren't, mm -hmm. I guess we're not true powerlifters. We're just bench. Yeah, specialists. that's a debate that's been <laughs> going on for decades. <laughs> so yeah, that was my first like kind of in introduction starting to get into powerlifting when I was did 16. You do the, did you do the high school meets or did you start straight in the USAPL? <sighs> 
No, I just so we were doing well different ones. APF, Wobdol, yeah, yeah. Uh, USAPL. But it wasn't the high school me. No, yeah, yeah. Didn't, we only, only football. It was like a big five A Texas high school, mm -hmm. so we didn't have anything like that. Okay. Um, so how long was it until you did your first meet then? Oh gosh, just uh, I trained for a few months and then hit the, hit the first one, mm -hmm. and that was a APF meet in Austin where Jill Mills lifted that, mm -hmm. meet, and she benched more than me, mm -hmm. and I was like, well, that's discouraging. Yeah, how right? was that experience? <laughs> Wild. Oh, it was yeah. wicked. I took we took my parents right, so they're like whole nother exposure to this yeah I, I keep shocking my parents of bodybuilding and powerlifting but um anyway yeah that was she total you <laughs> oh yeah yeah. Oh, yeah i benched only though so <laughs> yeah. I, I did uh i think it was 275 my first uh powerlifting meet for for bench press yeah, i had the the same experience for one of my first actual one yeah it was one of my first meets his it was before the rounds formula Right. Mm. So it just started with the weight, kind of like a length where weightlifting mm -hmm. does it just goes up right so it was like me and then me and then me and then it was like laura dodd right and it's i'm like a 350 400 450 she's like 500 right the bench i i had her on the bench right but then the deadlift the same type of thing and then afterwards i thought it was the greatest thing in the world like i just got waxed by laura dodd right so i can so i can be so much stronger I just suck and need to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, I figured if it was at least the world's strongest woman beating me. And I was yeah. in high school, I'm like, well, I accept this for now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <okay. laughs> when you did that, were you sold? Like, this is what you want to continue to keep doing? Oh, man. I was, I was sold before I even did the first yeah. one. I, I was already so bought in to lifting and strength and just the community that we had training with these guys that were older and kind of mentoring mm -hmm. me. I, I loved it. Um, so even before I did the first meet, I already knew I was bought in, but I am like an all in type of person, obsessive, probably like why we all cater into mm -hmm. these kind of sports, <laughs> but whatever it was, I was all into power. I did, um, paintball competitive competitions I and mean, I've done, uh, the track, I've done gymnastics, I've done martial arts, but nothing really stuck like weightlifting. Mm -hmm. I was, I was hooked. So, How long did you stay in powerlifting for? It was eight years, right? Then it was about eight years. So r roughly like 25, 26 is when i when i got out of it so i well, did it through yeah. college okay um, what were your best lifts uh best in, in a full meet my yeah. it was an 18 20 total yeah and that was uh call exactly what my number was i think it was 617 squat a uh 634 bench and a 606 deadlift yes i benched more than i squat yeah yeah <laughs> and, deadlift. and deadlifted yeah and deadlifted. <laughs> so I, I did bench only for a long time yeah. so my best Bench only meet in, in WABDL was a, a 706, and that was at 198 pounds. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, two, 220 pounds. I did mm -hmm. a, a um, was a 673 at 198. Mm -hmm. um, so that was single ply back then. Back mm -hmm. when I was doing it, it was you're still equipped. Mm -hmm. um, now yeah. Ross, yeah. the thing now. So yeah. I mm -hmm. guess, um, you know, whatever that means. Yeah. <laughs> yeah in powerlifting, you have a world record, but then. 10 other guys have world records in the same weight class in different federations. So mm -hmm. it kind of loses a little bit of the allure. But well, yeah. When you say you, you said you did like competitive paintball and all those other things, but they didn't stick. Do you think the community that you found with the lifting, like you said, you kind of got integrated into that group that educated you and gave you something to aim for upwards. Do you think that had an integral part in powerlifting sticking with you? compared to all the other sports or do you just think it was something that was just always going to click with you anyway i, I think it was something just within me because mm -hmm. even like when in power um like say paintball for instance mm -hmm. like i was still like the one that was all in more than my other friends that were doing it yeah. so i was kind of the one pulling them that way even in like high school lifting like I'm the one everyone's kind of coming to, to see like these opinions from like, John, what do you do? You're the mm -hmm. strong guy. You're so I think I pulled a lot of the people in having the community was a great aspect to it. Um, uh, but it still wasn't something just more innate that I, yep. I wanted out of it. Um, even bodybuilding now it's still, it's still kind of individual. In yeah. Sense, it just, right? And it just feels like it resonates with you on, yeah. a, on a basal level almost. Yeah. Did you connect with that more than say football team? Oh, no, I was terrible at team sports. Yeah, he's yeah. not a team yeah. player. Yeah. <laughs> well, so that was what I mean. What my experience was, and I played football and I was a captain of the team and all the other stuff, but I would get so pissed off, right? Because I'd bust my ass and then we'd lose, but I knew I did my part, you know, but the other people were doing their part, right? And that always drove me absolutely nuts, which kind of pushed me more into the powerlifting side of the whole thing. But I don't regret 
plan because I don't know how I would have learned teamwork outside of that, yeah. you know, so it had some value with that, but was that kind of the same thing for yourself? Yeah. I'm just kind of a con con uh, control freak in aspects. Yeah. So there's like a lack of control too. And uh, it, it's harder to progress in it because it is based on all these other players, like you're saying, mm -hmm. but I just wasn't as good at it. Mm -hmm. Um, like whatever that, what, like say football, like I, I wasn't the fastest. Um, I didn't have this long track of athletic background. Like some of these friends paid peewee football. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that. So, uh, things that just naturally weren't that great at, I just didn't want to do I want to do mm -hmm. stuff. I'm like excellent at yeah, <laughs> yeah. that I, I could see out the potential there. So if I was like mediocre at it, yeah, I just wouldn't, wouldn't mm -hmm. stick. Renee, how did you get into training? My story is not as exciting as mm -hmm. his. Um, I, I dabbled a little bit in high school with like my sister power lifted and she had like a bunch of like state records and everything. So I was like, okay, maybe this is something that mm -hmm. I can do. Anyway, she went off to college and I started dabbling a little bit. And my mom grew up in like the Jane Fonda era. Mm -hmm. And she, she, she was always like, no, you're just going to get like too bulky if you do that. You know, so I was like, OK, maybe I shouldn't do this. So like I kind of dabbled in like soccer and like golf and like all these other sports and it didn't stick, mm -hmm. you know. So I didn't do anything for a really long time. Like, um gosh, I didn't start till my early twenties. And initially I kind of got interested in like bodybuilding. I went to the LA fit expo and was kind of introduced to that world. Um, and there was a couple of athletes that I kind of followed a little bit at the time. And I saw them there like Jamie Eason around, around that mm -hmm. time and really looked up to her. And I was like, I want to do something like this. So I eventually like kind of got into the gym, started lifting a little bit, saw that there was a division called figure and I was like, okay, I want to, I want to do that. So I trained for like about a year and did a figure competition, did terrible. And I was like, okay, maybe I'm not cut out for this. You know, mm -hmm. took like a 10 year break. I was still going to the gym, like still really like love that bodybuilding lifestyle. Um, but kind of wrote off like competing, you know, until I met him mm -hmm. and, you know, he was all in it at the time, still is. But um, the wellness division came out and he was like, hey, you know, maybe you should uh, try this out. And I was like, I don't know. I really sucked when I did figure. Mm -hmm. So he convinced me to give wellness a try. And he has been coaching me since what? Pretty much since we met, yeah, 2017. Signed up for a lot, <laughs> yeah. I signed up for a lot, yeah. You want a boyfriend and a coach, like <laughs> yeah. what else? What's well, yeah, that like the deluxe yeah. platinum package on your website? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. For those that don't know, what's the difference between wellness and figure and also bodybuilding as well? Because there's a transition there as well. Well, wellness is the newer division that mm -hmm. came out, well, they started in 2019. It was already in like South America, Brazil, but they brought, brought it to the IFBB. Um, and it's um, basically a more developed lower body, smaller, less developed upper body. So what are they judging on? Um, I, I get it. It's a subjective yeah. sport, right? But compared to like figure, what are they judging compared to that? F figure has more of that kind of like X frame, yeah. right? So like wider back, mm -hmm. like wider clavicles, more developed upper body, probably more narrow hips, less mm -hmm. developed in the glutes, legs. Um, whereas wellness, you want more development. Um, size is, you know, a lot more than figure would be, mm -hmm. but the upper body is smaller. What about that makes sense. Uh, leanness? Leanness for wellness, it's supposed to be just about like yeah. the bikini. Well, isn't that how figure started too? Yeah, it's, it's kind <laughs> so of so it's kind of going that way where it's getting leaner and leaner a with wellness. Bit. It, has, yeah. it has shifted. It it shifted that way. Like we were prepped her for like her first sh shows where we were doing it. Like she had glute striations. Yeah. Like it was lean, and that was rewarded. Then they started pulling like her lash. They did like you're a little too hard now. Yeah. Of course, yeah. so yeah. it's it's trying to have the balance still of like not too conditioned but still have the separation of like a glute and yeah. hamstring it's always good when they let you know what they're looking for afterwards right <laughs> right <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> but with well of course it's like a huge huge emphasis on just have gigantic have gigantic mm -hmm. glutes mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> so. so what what has it been like with him being your coach and you coaching her because that's that's a different dynamic like does she 
send you photos? I mean, how do you do the checks and stuff like that? I'm like a regular old client. Like I take pictures, I send them a check-in and we keep the coach client relationship, you know, very separate from the husband wife. Now, did it start that way or did it start with you just looking at her? No, it started that way too. And I'm also very like tracking and comparing Mm -hmm. back things. So it's like, well, I need this just for the tracking purposes that I'd want to do compare back things over time. So I wanted those things in place anyway, but that's how, that's how it started. And I figure it would be because in my last relationship, my last marriage, I tried to do this as well. And Mm -hmm. it was a disaster, right? (laughs) So, but different dynamic, right? It's, I would brought bodybuilding in at that time. So I wasn't seen in that role. Well, when we got together, I was already John, the bodybuilder and the coach. Mm-hmm. So different view a little mm-hmm. bit, but at the same time, like Renee, it works well. Cause Renee's one that, uh, I would have to pull her back and save herself mm-hmm. versus have to police and push her more. And I think when you have the spouse that you're having to do that with, that's where you can run into probably problems. So I don't have to ever worry about Renee is going to cheat on her diet. I need to be like eyeing her food or, you know, mm-hmm. so she'll, she'll execute. So it makes it a little easier in that sense. Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd say the same. I, I coach my wife, Naomi and have done for pretty much the whole time we've been together. Um, and yeah, life's way easier when and people are like, Oh, how do you do that? How'd you wear two hats? It's like, well, she's an easy client. <laughs> you know, uh-huh. how's, yeah. that, how's that work if you if you're in a fight, right? So she's pissed at you for whatever reason, or you're pissed <laughs> at her for whatever reason, but that checkup still has to happen. Does that still happen? Yeah, just sorry, babe. I'm doubling your cardio this week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Send that mm-hmm. shit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You get what I'm saying yeah, though, yeah, because yeah. life is life, right? Uh, Things there's ups and downs is all that too. It the check-ins will still happen. We we're pretty easy going. Mm-hmm. Um, so we never had some big blowout ever no. to where you're like, mm-hmm. done, I'm not sending you check-ins. Like check-ins will still happen. So that communication happens on the coaching front. But yeah. we're more if we do have an argument, it's usually more the we're kind of stonewallers and we'll like check out. Yeah, for the, we just won't mm-hmm. talk. Check, check out for a minute, much. then come back together. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> so yeah, I guess that that yeah. works for us personality wise too. Yeah, mm-hmm. but it, it also has been great with because we'll compete at the same time and prep at the same time. So mentally, we're same focused. You know, like we're both hungry together. I was about know? to say, what's that like when you're both getting real close? Then, gosh, you know, people like we know some couples that you know mm-hmm. compete together, and they tell us like how hard it is and how do you guys mm-hmm. do it? And for us, it just works. Is like, it a case of just mutual suffering? Is it, is it it is exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you you understand how the other person feels, yeah. but uh-huh. you forget. How mm-hmm. bad it sucks, right? Yeah. When you're in the off season with food, you're like, oh yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that prep again. Like that wasn't mm-hmm. too bad. Then you get back and you're like, why am I yeah, doing this? This is ridiculous. <laughs> so yeah, you understand the other person's feelings, but we've done some things where I was in the off season or she was in prep. I'm like, dang, her name's like, she's kind of fiery today. Mm-hmm. But in prep, I probably wouldn't even realize it because I'm just yeah. trying to bear my own yeah, yeah. misery. <laughs> yeah, I said, yeah, you preoccupied mm-hmm. with your own suffering at that point. Yeah. What was it like with you both doing the Olympia at the same time? I think you hit a nerve. <laughs> it was. Well, uh, I mean, what, I mean, it's. it's, a, it's I'm. I'm high anxiety when I. Yeah, compete, I mean, so. that's a big stage. It's the yeah. biggest stage, right? But it's. It's also awesome that you're both doing it at the same time. You know, as an outsider looking in, I'm like, this is freaking awesome. But you know, gotta ask. <laughs> no, I know we. What an opportunity! It was yeah. just. It was a rough year in prep, because um, that was like the the COVID years as well. Yeah. So like. Was that being moved around that year? It, was it 2021 that, that was, you did it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Right, so um, it got bumped, right? Or was that the 2020 shows that they were moving around? It was the 2020 shows yeah, that 2020. they were moving around. Yeah. And so, yeah, when she she won Tampa, we ended up both getting like COVID around that time too. Yeah. But you're qualified for the Olympia. And she was like, I was near so, bed bound for like two so weeks. Bad. <laughs> but how do you not do the Olympia? Yeah. yeah. Like this might be your only one and mm-hmm. the first time they're doing wellness. Well, it. and I think there was like an eight week span between Tampa and the Olympia. So when I got sick, it like took me out for like two solid weeks. And it's like, okay, now you have this short period that you need to jump back into prep mm-hmm. and get ready for the Olympia. And it's like, okay, you're stepping onto the biggest stage in the world and you're just coming off of being really sick. And now mm-hmm. you have to go back into prep. It's it was a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so so mentally, it was, it was a tough spot yeah. for her because she wasn't bringing her her best look that she knew she could. Um, amazing experience to share. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just the actual 
being able to sit in the moment and just cherish that for what it was, was harder because the performance side, you mm-hmm. worried about how you're going to look at that day. So it did kind of pull back mm-hmm. a little bit of what the moment could have mm-hmm. been. Uh, but reflecting on it, I mean, it was still phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Or being still further awesome. away, you can reflect on it differently. Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, being competitors, it's, you, you're always going to be upset that yeah. you couldn't bring your best. Sure. But looking back now, how was the, like you said, how was the experience? It, with some room between that uh i, I mean for sure i was yeah. always thankful we yeah, did yeah, it yeah, without yeah. a yeah, question for sure. yeah, yeah and we had there's just such a cool picture we have of us walking together with our jewets on the back right mm-hmm. we're like going to the olympia the olympias in the background and uh it's like such a, a, a rarity that you're gonna have yeah two i mean people i, married I, that I are never thought together. that i would yeah. turn pro let alone like step mm-hmm. on the olympia stage so to do it together it was just I mean, it's amazing, you know? Yeah. If, if I may, I just want to go back to the point you made about being very anxious. Because this is actually a, a question I had written down for you anyway. When you get um, competitors who are naturally very nervous and very anxious, right? I mean, I think it's quite, would you agree that it's quite common that sometimes the reason competitors will miss their peak is because they're so worried about missing their peak. The stress and the anxiety and the cortisol and the adrenaline just causes all the water. You, you know this stuff better than I do. So when you've got someone now who was also your wife or in that scenario, what do you have any tactics to help deal with competitors who are naturally anxious so that we don't they don't miss their peak because they're worrying about missing their peak? I think a lot of it's in just the, the preparation, at least if you're not mm-hmm. in person, like I'm of course in person with Renee, but if you're online coaching and your coach sends you the plan, a lot of people are just out there. Like I've been in that position. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of things that are left for you to figure out. Right. And especially when you change the environment and you're now at the show mm-hmm. and you're not in your monotonous routine every day, like you've been in prep, you're like, well, when should I go to Tana? Do I take my food with me? Like, do I, how do I get my information, to my coach? There's a lot of questions around that, that can build a lot of anxiety. So at least for like coaching athletes, a lot of things is I try to like lay out the planning as far as travel goes. Mm-hmm. Hey, don't fly in at some crazy ass time in the morning. You have to get up way earlier or fly in really late and make sure you have enough time advanced and then planning out the day too. So I like give times with even meals. Yeah. Some people don't do that. They're just like, yeah, just eat, you know, every so often with fluids, everything. So it's like configured to where there's not as much stress to build yeah. up. So I think the planning piece is huge for yeah. one, but again, you can't remove too much without just going through it. Yeah, for sure. Like you have to go through it. Then also I think um, having some guidance around the psychological side of planning out the, the vision of like you going on stage. So a lot of times doing my cardio was like me thinking about being in line and what that would feel like and what I want to feel like in line. Then before walking on stage, what do I want to feel like, what's it feel like, like mm-hmm. John Jewett in a, you know, first mm-hmm. place. Like, yeah like letting that just filter in my mind. So when I do get back there, I can kind of call to that. So I think the psychological training is Mm -hmm. a big piece, especially to foster that in the people that you are, Mm -hmm. are coaching. But again, like I said, it it comes down to experience. Like you you just have to go through it. I do like what you said there about like, you know, if you've got someone who's naturally anxious, they're an overthinker. So the more, the more structure you give them, the less they have to, yeah. And I, you know, I, I've seen plans where it's like, yeah, just eat carbs mainly on the day. And it's like, well, you couldn't give them any <laughs> <Yeah>. less information. <laughs> Whereas if it's eat this at seven, eat this at 10, okay, it's effort to do exactly that. But at least now I have infinitely less questions and things to think about. And and how far we want to go here, but uh, if, in a hypothetical, you could even use something that like even uh, musicians and things have mm-hmm. used for like performance anxiety and keep things yeah. steady. Like some mm-hmm. people have used different beta blockers yeah. on, on mm-hmm. show day to relieve some of that. So yeah. you're like, Hey, you don't at least have the symptoms of anxiety, you know, about to go on your mm-hmm. heart rates jumping and you realize that now it jumps even more. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. you feel like the shakes. It's like you had some that calm that a little bit. Yeah. That may keep you a little bit more steady on stage. So some people have used things like that. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't bank on those. Try to do all the other things first yeah, before going sure. somewhere mm-hmm. out like that. But it, it could be uh, things that could be utilized. Yeah. But it's just, I think that's a variable that doesn't get spoken about. Yeah. Uh, no, not that much, you know. And you're right. It's, it, you do everything before. Like, what are you going to do mm-hmm. on the actual stage? So it's like people suck at posing. Mm-hmm. No one <laughs> yeah. practices their posing. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, I'm going to go play this basketball game. Mm-hmm. So like, have you dribbled the ball? <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, that's the, literally what you're going to do. Figure it out. So out there it's like mm-hmm. oh yeah i don't practice my posing like mm-hmm. well you'd be probably less nervous you knew you could walk out there and nail yeah. your routine know exactly what you're going to do and that's another 
piece of it too mm-hmm. is like we we lack a lot of the mm-hmm. coaching around everything outside of just when someone's calling you up for poses and what i mean mm-hmm. by that is like what do you do when you're standing on the sidelines before they call you to the middle mm-hmm. or your transitions or what do you do when before they're like all right guys we're about to call the pose and you're like should I hold my pose tight or relax or how do I save my breath? Mm-hmm. Like all that should be trained. So you're less, yeah. less nervous. You're actually there. training the art and the skill of the competing rather than just yeah. get, getting them in the shape to do it. Absolutely. Yeah. Kind of like you do for every sport. Yeah. Funny that, right? right? It's a fundamental. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. When did the pivot and why the pivot into bodybuilding? My initial, well, I guess, gosh, going back, I was a kid of the late 80s, early 90s. So it was all about muscle, right? Mm -hmm. Arnold and Stallone and Van Damme. So I always wanted that look. I just happened to be strong. Mm -hmm. And so that led to powerlifting. I was hoping by the time I was benching over whatever, 400 pounds, that I had like this big chest and (laughs) triceps. That was the case. So I remember one meet. I was in the bathroom and, you know, I was washing my hands. Some guy came up and watched me. He's like, oh, cool. What, what are you doing? Are you doing the 165? I was 181 at the time. Mm-hmm. Like, God, oh, that was man. demoralizing. Thanks. <laughs> let me go lift some heavy ass weight now. Yeah. It's like someday I want to actually look bigger than, you know, mm-hmm. I actually weigh. Uh, so I always had that in the back of my mind. But eventually in powerlifting, I was starting to kind of beat my own records. And I always started to like reach a peak where things weren't progressing as much either. Um, and it just started losing interest and Mm -hmm. I always had bodybuilding in the back of my mind. And so that's when I made the transition and I was always the meticulous power lifter by that point. So I had my like Excel sheet, my diet all mapped out. Like what power lifter does that? Like you don't need any chicken or rice as your power lifter. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's more common today, but back (laughs) then, no, I didn't know. Am I I, just you? I'm going to guess and say it was just you. That was (laughs) it. Yeah. 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 Like I want to mass on this, like, you know, rice and chicken that <laughs> mm-hmm. dry as fuck so but yeah anyway that was around that time um started transitioning like all right i'm gonna i'm gonna give this bodybuilding thing a go mm-hmm. and just uh had a show in mind the lachlan because that was our san antonio show and uh planned out for a year and that's when i when i jumped in so how do you change your training well uh we're talking about elite fts and all the mm-hmm. articles and things come about so my introduction was through uh, rest like DC training because mm-hmm. Justin Harris was writing articles yeah. for Elite FTS. I'm like, this guy has like some thought out approach in bodybuilding when you didn't find other people that were really leaving out thought like a thoughtful bodybuilding approach. It's more like magazine articles and stuff mm-hmm. right, that you couldn't make sense of. So dug into DC training, read everything I could on the forums around it, and that was my first introduction. It connected well because it was still performance based. So it's I, hard. Yeah. And yeah, I, yeah. and I love grinding weights. Mm-hmm. That's what, if anything I learned from powerlifting, like that's it, you know how to grind out weights and that's what I could take into like doing DC training. Mm-hmm. So that was the, the initial, um, I was doing like four days a week. It was that rotation of like a kind of a push pull legs back then and, uh, jumped to a few different programs, but always had switched a little bit back to doing, doing some form of like DC training. Mm -hmm. Um, my, my mistake was that I still had the powerless mentality of point A to point B. Mm -hmm. There was no like thought of like what comes between. Yeah. And so that, that led to just, uh, some unproductive years. I have some injuries and think nothing major, but still I could have been more precise, probably use less load and, uh, probably a little more accurate in development, uh, things that were lacking and from power, from powerlifting, like it didn't have delts, right? Mm-hmm. Never do a lateral raise, mm-hmm. didn't do enough rowing work. So there's things that just, I could have done better thinking back. How'd the first show go? Decent. Uh, I won the o- overall in the novice. Mm-hmm. I won my, op- uh, I was a middleweight. I won that and almost won the overall in the, in the <laughs> open, but the heavyweight won. So it was, uh, it was a good first outing. I, I coached myself to it. Um, it was pretty conditioned. Could have been better. But again, I was coaching myself. Yeah. It's when you're just, you're broke bodybuilding and you do what you can. Mm-hmm. So, but I was, again, like powerlifting hooked. So then what was the road to getting your pro card? Yeah. So that was, uh, took another off season. Um, went to the, the show that I was told to go to was the Texas State. And that's when I realized it was a bit more demoralizing. I got, I got eighth or ninth at that show. And there, that was when the Texas state was still like, 
it was really hard to get to nationals. So your guys that would actually qualify were now circling back through. Mm -hmm. And there were some guys that all, all of them had like eventually turned pro. And I like didn't have enough tan on. I wasn't lean enough. I wasn't big enough. So I'm like, damn, okay, this is what it takes. Another year went by, did the branch one classic, um, got in better shape. I won. And that's when I was like, okay, I'm going to take another year and then I'm going to be my first national show. And that's when I also decided I should probably hire a coach. Mm -hmm. um, stop trying to reinvent the wheel over here. But that I did want nationals once. I sucked all the way down to be a middleweight again and then came back the next year as a heavyweight and won at the USA's, which was a, a pretty big transformation. So I wouldn't. Weighed in at 176. I was about 184 ready. Uh, the next year, I came back and was was 209 when I actually competed, but was like 214, 215 oh. um, the day before. So had 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 a good decent like 30 pounds of stage weight that I added throughout that year. Wow, that that led to mm -hmm. that USA's win. So I think a a, a big part, why crucial detail there that was kind of glossed over was competition year break competition. <laughs> Your, how many people are doing how many people are going into their first show and being patient enough to go one year then do you know what i mean like as opposed to you know maybe even more on the female side you know better than i do where they want to compete every six or nine months and then they wonder why they're stepping on stage two pounds better off or or whatever it might be but even there right from the start you're taking a whole year to actually get better before you go back in and assess yeah, it's it's so rushed nowadays. Everyone, people come to me like, "Hey, I want the pro card this year, and I want to hit this show." And like when I was first doing it, you, there was only really bodybuilding around, and so you realize, okay, this is like a five to ten year endeavor to maybe get a mm -hmm. pro card. So the time commitment was there. I could see out the long term, but I just knew I need, needed time to grow. So what do you do with this show? Evaluate. What do you need? More size? Okay, let me do that. How long that's going to take? I think a good year is a good mm -hmm. good starting point. Um, Reevaluate the next show and just keep keep moving up from there. When you came in, was where was the pro card status? Because it's it's increased, right? Was it still like overall only for the USA, or was it overall and each division? You had you had the first in your division, first in your yeah. division. Okay, because going back further, I think it was only overall it for was, the USA, it was, right? It was the only overall. Not yeah. sure when they actually started that. Yeah. Um, close, close in the overall, uh, Rashid Oldacre, he was the super heavy. He won. Mm -hmm. Now I won, I won the heavies. Uh, but I, now it seems like it's quite, I want to say it's easier to get a pro card, but it's diluted down. There's I, just more of them. There's, there's more nationals. There's more, more competitors too, but shifting in different federation, uh, different divisions, mm -hmm. right? Classic is, is challenging. Yeah. And it's so deep bodybuilding. It's kind of, yeah, diminished a little bit. So. Well, I think as it grows, they'll probably pull them back a little bit because a lot of these new divisions, you have to have people in them. You do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah. it makes, I see every, I, I see the reason why people complain, but you know, that there's too many, but I think they forget the fact that you still have to have people in the shows. Right. And if there's more pro shows, which everybody wants, right, mm -hmm. right, then you got to have people in them. Yeah. And now it's as these divisions have all grown, you know, it, at some point, I don't know. It, I would think it, now you start trimming it back. And they have. Yeah. They have. And, and so, like this year, it's extremely competitive and deep lineups in these pro shows. Mm -hmm. So, e either way, like your top pro guys are going to rise to the top. Yeah. So, at the highest level, you're still going to see the best of the best. So, uh, what does it mean for a pro card? Like back in the early 2000s, it's like if you were a pro, there's only a few of them. You can yeah. tell when you saw a pro. Now it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're pros. We're all pros. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, but still like what's the point you want to look like yeah. you're a pro yeah um, renee what was your path to the pro card oh gosh mine was quick <laughs> it really was mm -hmm. i so wellness division um started in 2019 and i did my first regional show in 2020 um and that was in tampa um i won my class there and was it four weeks later yeah Four weeks later, I did my first national show at Junior USA's. I got third there, and he convinced me to do. Yeah, six six cookies deep. Yeah, I was like, like yeah. hey, let's come on. Six, <laughs> six sushi rolls and six cookies deep, like 12 pounds up. He was like, hey, let's do this next show like six days later. I was like, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, we booked a flight in Charlotte to go to Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. 
to jump over right over there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So I competed in Pittsburgh and that's, I won um, my class and that's where I turned pro. Okay. Um, Well, at that point, I mean, it's just re it's just putting glycogen back in. Right? Yeah, and basically. Yeah, she was right condi- it yeah. was fine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just drop some water. Yeah, <laughs> it was okay. Yeah, that was that was COVID, right? So that show was in a tent oh. with only the judges and the competitors. So. Yeah, so nobody, there wasn't an audience. He was back in That's the hotel. That's the show room. that you won your pro. That show was on? the one. And oh, you know, God. thinking about winning my pro card, I imagined yeah. it so big in my head. So to have them call my name like Renee Jew at IFBB Pro, like you walk out there and it's just silence. <laughs> oh, no wow. clapping nobody yelling for Mm -hmm. you just silent so it was kind of like a bummer Mm -hmm. but i saw him like when we were all done and like he just had like the tears in his eyes Mm -hmm. and it it was it was a great experience at that show Mm -hmm. i ran down to outside the tent (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. i mean overall it was good for what it was um and then i took about a year off season from there about a year off season um did my first pro show in chicago and got third there and then a couple weeks later, yeah, it was right? like four weeks. Four, about Tampa. four weeks later, did Tampa and won my first pro show. Mm-hmm. So it escalated very quickly from turning pro to winning my first pro show to stumping on the Olympia stage. That's great. After like not competing yeah. for. 10 years and being very new yeah. to it so no it's great it's also no. great because there's a lot of people that are gonna be so pissed off because of i know that, but <laughs> yeah she's the one great. hey i want to turn pro this year like well shit okay i guess you can do it <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah and when did your training change because you had the dc training the powerlifter mentality and all that when did it change to have bodybuilding intent and more focused to actually build muscle and maintain muscle through contest prep it was just a development along the way. So there wasn't some big transition point. You know, you're kind of picking up things from guys that you're just interacting yeah. with and seeing. So, um, well, to a point, but you've sure. taken the education to a whole different level. Right. Right. So you've gone deep in all this stuff. So was it because of lack of progress or because you just infatuated with it? Absolutely obsessed on every yeah. level. So anything that I could find to get better, that's what I do. Like, why did I go to school? Well, as a means to just provide for myself in bodybuilding mm-hmm. or yeah. find things yeah. that I can study to be a better bodybuilder. Mm-hmm. And so resulted in a career. But the main thing was just how can I just keep bot- mm-hmm. powerlifting bodybuilding? Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, it was, uh, I think, working for one, getting a coach. My first coach was Matt Jansen. That was an excellent you know, experience and having someone guide me. I wish I did that earlier on. That would have been. Would you have listened, though? <laughs> earlier on yeah i, I would have listened actually okay. i just didn't have the the financial means to hire or even know where to go like back then it's like who your coach well there's some local guys around mm-hmm. or you know um to the, we didn't have the so- social media then like we do now so now you kind of know who all the coaches are yeah and so uh, yeah i, I would have listened it's probably more of a problem for me to listen now <laughs> yeah now i know too much to <laughs> to listen to someone else but um so yeah, that taught me a lot and showed me a lot of things about even even execution of lifts and changing the program around to look like you bring in some extra volume and hey, you need to dial back in these certain areas when you're going into prep to where you can't just keep training like an animal all the mm-hmm. way through, right? Um, but it was kind of finding a little bit more of the middle ground. Uh, but well, yeah. with the listening, now you have a different filter, right? So yeah. you, you can listen to advice and pick from it and kind of know what's bullshit and what's not. Yeah. Right. Because people can stumble their way to the top, but usually there's something if you dig in there enough and ask the right questions, you can figure out kind of why they got there. Right. And with more education, it's easier for you to like filter down into that. And it's usually not the reason they think that they got there for, you know, it's usually some other low hanging fruit. Sometimes that's where you can pick up something, you know, that may work for somebody else. Um, when did you sign with Animal? Was that as a power lifter? No, that was in 2016. So mm-hmm. it was right after I turned pro. Mm-hmm. They, they reached out and said, hey, interested. You look like you fit well with the brand and signed on with them, which was phenomenal because coming from the powerlifter background, of course, you saw Animal <laughs> yeah. and, the, and all, the, all the black and white ads, the motivational quotes, just blue collar. Like, And I started – the where I started training, 
was my two my two dad's two story uh, cabinet shop right mm-hmm. so it's all just woodworking I had a drop light had an extension cord that ran up to my little stereo so I was very alone in a dark room and so you seeing those ads it's like I connect so well to this mm-hmm. so signing with animal was uh, just such a great alignment for my personality of being kind of the introvert but also just loving to just train all yeah, out yeah uh, and uh, yeah, got got on board with them. Well, it's a good product too. I mean, I've used their ISO way for th- like decades. Yeah, you know, in the packs, which you got. I always try to choke them down and gulp. Right, <laughs> right. Is, you know, it's, it was the hardcore product. You see, like, like right I don't know. Size. Yeah, it is. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, before that, I, I was talking with um, Bugs about this. You remember the beef liver tabs? Yeah, you know the horse pills. Yeah, I, I always had this thing like, how many can I gulp at one time? Because you're taking like twenty per meal or something. Yeah. I got up to like fifteen. Like, so I'd scale it up, right? And it's like period, period. <laughs> yeah. So the animal packs were not that big of a deal. It's just like there's some little ones, a couple big ones. I can kill this, done, right? They've advanced a lot now. Yeah, now they're like twenty five percent less pills. And yeah, like, yeah, yeah, it's way easier. The formulations, way easier. or there's just yeah. powder. Yeah. yeah, or powder forms that yeah. taste good. Yeah, they yeah. don't taste like ass. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Well, that's the, that's the thing with the the ISO way, right? It doesn't taste like ass. Yeah. Now they have a clear. Yeah. Now it's like fruity flavors. It's, it's like really clears good. the water. You're like, man, that it's, uh, this stuff was out when I first started. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. <laughs> now with going back into the training side, um, cause we can go deep into that. He's probably got a whole page of stuff right. there. <laughs> um, as that evolved as the nutrition and everything else, you get to a certain point where you think that you know it all, or right, let, let me refer you get to a point where you know how to execute it. Right. And then actually, you to, then you got to figure out how to pivot, you know, as you're moving through that. So with the training, how does that differ as you move into the show? Yeah. Uh, I know some people say, like, hey, what built the mass is what keeps the mass on. Right. So yeah. They continue this, what they did into their prep. I think that's okay to an extent. I think for one year, how you execute your exercises should always be standardized and that shouldn't really change. I think where we, or the background that I came from was like with the log book and DC training and making sure you beat the book. It was the wrong intent that I had. I don't think that's what even Dante was trying to teach in it. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause now the shift in mindset was like, well, the log book is now more your diagnostic tool not this thing to beat on the on the scoreboard every day so my diagnostic tool around gym performance will align if i have enough recoverability at the current moment and there was adaptations to now express in my current training session or if i'm need to dial back that training so now i'm looking as more of this tool and i'm standardizing my execution and my effort so now when i get to repeat this day if i don't have that performance that recovery and fatigue might be in diminishing points to where I need to make the adjustment versus before would be like, I just need to lift harder yeah. to make sure I uphold this performance and that will keep the muscle on. But really it's only continuing the fatigue buildup and probably making it my prep even harder. Yeah. So the biggest shift that I'd say that I made like across prep is getting better at fatigue management. And that just wasn't even connected back then and finding ways to create the same deficit with less fatigue and less perception of effort. But the training side, yeah, that was uh, realizing now when I should be pulling back on at least initial parts of prep, things that are very fatiguing that don't have a lot of stimulus that come about. Like, so rest pause sets, Mm -hmm. these drop sets, I would initially shift to just doing straight sets and longer rest times. So make the best stimulus I can on a per set basis. So keep that quality really high. Then as I move through prep, just adjusting volume based on that recovery capacity as I get close to the show. And sp- so in a way, the training becomes a diagnostic tool to gauge your recovery, your nutrition and everything else. Yeah. Right. Whereas before it's kind of like opposite. Right. They're just disconnected. Yeah. And there's even disconnect with like just sleep and the priority around that. Like everything's very um, carp- compartmentalized mm-hmm. versus being all intertwined. Mm-hmm. So it's a more of a realization around that. Even like when we were first got together and I was prepping for some of these shows, my preps were brutal. Like I would be doing two hours in the Stairmaster, wow. like level 10 and leg fatigue all day. You go home on the couch, you just sit there to your next cardio session or training session. And you're like, why am I doing 1500 calories? And, this much cardio it's like well it's just been this accumulation of like 
a realization that was a huge point for me was like, you should start tracking your, your steps. People started talking about non-exercise activity thermogenesis, mm -hmm. your act daily activity. It's like, well, I don't even track any of this. And I started tracking and realized that I only have like 3000 steps a day. It's like, whoa, if I start just yeah. walking, it's like an easy means to expend energy and I'm doing less cardio and eating more food now. And in turn, better training performance, better muscle retention because of that and less fatigue from all this uh, lowered st uh, Stairmaster amount. So there was just disconnects, things that picking up throughout that. So now like you're upholding training performance and you have your better muscle retention throughout your prep. Mm -hmm. I think uh, tracking the activity is huge in prep yeah, because yeah. I think people, people really don't realize on a subconscious level, once that deficit starts getting big and that fatigue starts, how much less you move. <laughs> like, yeah. you know what I mean? Your, your metabolic rate comes down, your body temperature drops a little but you'll just inherently move less you'll well, fidget your body less. just wants to conserve what yeah. energy it has so if you didn't tell them anything and then you look at their average step count like 16 yeah. weeks out and you look at it four weeks uh -huh. out i bet the difference is enormous but they don't uh -huh. they don't whereas if you now all of a sudden you're like you need to track this and keep that stable all of a sudden that's an extra 150 calories a day or whatever they're burning that they don't even know about that they can bring back in food and whatever. But just to go back to the point you made about training there with like the rest pauses and the drop sets, making your training more efficient is probably what is probably a good way of summing up what you were trying to say there. Would you say that's agreeable? Yeah, I could agree around yeah, that. Yeah, because I think, and you know, if we just downscale this to like say gen pop, you know, not ultra competitive, just people who want to look a bit better naked or whatever, usually the first thing they'll do when they go into a fat loss phase is they'll worry about like, well, I'm in deficit, I'm going to lose muscle. I better start in and drop sets. Or it's better started in adding in that extra set or two to make sure I keep that muscle. And then they get fatigued and they're like, oh shit, I look like crap. I feel like crap. I must be losing muscle. I must need the extra drop set. <laughs> Maybe one drop set. Do you know what I mean? People are almost wired the other way. Whereas I'm glad you're going at it there from the other point. You're saying, no, when you've got all the, your resources are doing this. So your training just has to become more efficient. And then you're tracking your performance to see like, well, if anything, my performance goes down, I probably need to do less potentially. Yeah. I mean, the, the simple analogy is like your recovery is uh, your, what's in your bank account. Mm -hmm. You only have so much to spend. And once you're out, well, I guess you could take out your credit card debt, mm -hmm. but at some point you pay it back with you interest, will, right? You will pay it back. You pay it back hard, right? What does that yeah. lead to? Uh, it could be stall outs or yeah. you know, injuries or things mm -hmm. like things like that. So um, yeah, it's, it's just trying to manage your, the, the highest quality training that you can um, with accumulating least amount of fatigue. But prep is just this inevitable snowball mm -hmm. of fatigue that's just coming for you no matter what. Yeah, absolutely. So at some point, you're going to have to sacrifice some training performance. Mm -hmm. It very well could happen. It's just how, how are you going to manage that? I think the emotional side, there's a lot of maturity that has to come through. I think that's when it's prepping yourself, especially coming from a powerlifting background where the numbers matter. Mm -hmm. uh, you're tied to lifts that you try to probably uphold them for longer rather than pivot and shift those lifts to ones that have better, uh, maybe external bracing, like mm -hmm. moving from the back yeah. squat to the hack squat. So yeah. you, you still get good stimulus, but it's not so like fatiguing, uh, making those type of shifts. Or if you, and especially you'll see like th that lift drops off the back squat, but your isolations hold. So it's like, okay, this isn't me just as a whole getting weaker. Just my bracing is not translating into the force output as much. So it's making like, yeah, those adjustments. So I just got a lot, lot better at that and managing it on a training day to training day aspect mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, with having a coach online, you just limited, you don't have that guy yeah. following you around all day long. So the, tra I think a lot of things get lost in the training performance side from bodybuilding that are, you could take notes from the power lifters from mm -hmm. and let that still be a huge tool that you're utilizing to let that guide your process mm -hmm. as a bodybuilder, even, even drug wise with what we're doing with PEDs and prep. The, what I was introduced to is like, you use the most PEDs ever in mm -hmm. prep, but why? And these are the questions mm -hmm. that I was bringing. Yeah, why? Yeah, yeah. I want to know why, why do we do this? Um, how do you, and when I was coaching people and trying to learn it, like, how do I justify using this or bringing mm -hmm. this in? And well, what do they do? Okay muscle retention this is what steroids do all right well what's the best proxy that we're losing muscle in prep 
gym performance decline. Mm -hmm. That'd be a pretty good one. Mm -hmm. So now we should be going off probably gym performance of programming what's your need of PDs to uphold that. Mm -hmm. Not based on, I don't know, throw the kitchen sink at it, bro. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so like now we, our logbook is, is, is our diagnostic tool around recoverability, our mm -hmm. nutrition, our training, but also like guiding guiding PDs. And yeah. we, we gave a lot of good insight. I was prepping for the New York Pro in 2018. And this is with Matt. And we started, you know, started the, the prep cycle. Everything goes up, it gets thrown in. A strength skyrockets, right? Everything's skin full. My weight stays up. You're like, well, hey, John, you got to get down to 212. You're thinking like, well, why don't we use half of what we're using? Because now at this point, you're just getting to maintain muscle. Mm -hmm. And this is when I realized like, okay, you can use a whole lot less to maintain muscle in a contest prep. But I think where, where people get real argumentative around it is that if you don't manage the prep variables well, you're going to see that training performance really drop off because you sleep like shit. You overstress and overwork, you overtrain. So now what? You need more drug mm -hmm. to make up for all your management mm -hmm. of your other variables. Yeah. So that leads to that. And then also labeling compounds inappropriately for what they do. Like every compound is a magic unicorn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This That's makes a fat you loss drug. That's yeah. a get massive yeah. drug. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So then you lead to having all of them in. You're like, mm -hmm. I don't really have a good rationale behind it. But yeah. Um back back to the the point here is that uh yeah, PEDs, like mm -hmm. it still comes down to like managing training performance and yeah. moving that up and down um, based and that will drive the the need for that component. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned like exercise variations there though, because like when you diet down, you will lose passive stability, trunk stability, you don't, yeah. unless you're, you are under trained before it strength wise and now you're making up whatever. So like, but if you're then you're swapping over, you're going from your back squat to your hack squat because it's less neurologically demanding, it's easier to recover from. If you're getting stronger on those, but your back squat's going down, you're still, you're probably even maybe putting on muscle. It's just your leverages over here are changing, so you can't put the force into the bar as well. But then it, when you put yourself in those stable environments where the muscle output is the only variable, you're getting stronger or you're staying the same, you got nothing to worry about, right? But again, people will worry about that bit over there going down and think that's a surefire sign that everything's going to hell. But it's like, well, look at the other 90, 80, 90% 90 on the machines, the cables. How are you performing on those? Oh, well, they're up 5% in the last four weeks. It's like, what more evidence do you want? You know? It's a, it's a hard one to gauge because with, with, at least with powerlifting, it's, you do need the numbers to go up to yeah. a degree. Right. But with bodybuilding, mm -hmm. like the external load you're lifting doesn't necessarily mean to it's more tension at mm -hmm. the fiber level. Yeah. Right. You could be altering your form to where maybe you mm -hmm. do lift more load, but you don't ex expose your muscle to more tension that would cause yeah. that stimulus. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, and that's very hard one to gauge. Like mm -hmm. it's, uh, unless you're like, meticulously filming your sits and watching your bar velocities and things yeah. which no one's no one's doing um you know in that regard i do like clients to like video their lifts and mm -hmm. send in at least at least four compound lifts that i can watch across a prep so where we see at the end yeah. of a training block that we see vast shifts in those form mm -hmm. forms off season or prep yeah so i think bodybuilders could also take some sure. some advice from the powerlifters like even recording sets and watching how mm -hmm. You could improve form, but also if it's slipping away, just to try to drive up numbers, mm -hmm. I think you could realize that your numbers actually move a lot slower than you, you think yeah. they, they should be. Because yeah. uh, then it all comes down to what's the purpose of the exercise, right? Like, right. sure, you, your back squat's gone up 20 pounds, but if it's half a good morning now and you're using it <laughs> to grow your quads, is it really a better stimulus? Well, no. Yeah. <laughs> it might get you bigger erectors and bigger glutes, though. It depends what you really want at this point, you know? But yeah, I think because... How you perform a lift, even tiny little tweaks like that can just change the muscle recruitment so much. And if you're not focusing on that, then the quality of your work drops. And then the whole basis of your workout is based on not a lot, really. So how would you, how would you manipulate the training volume? So we'll give an instance of, say you're going to pull the back squat out, right? So because it creates more systemic fatigue, then it's going to be replaced with the hack squat, which is less systemic fatigue. Or I'll use a better example. Say it's a, a bench press, right? That's going to get pulled out and it's going to go to dumbbell press. So there's a difference in the systemic fatigue. Or say it gets replaced with a standing cable press. 
right? So you can create the muscle tension that you're looking for, the pump that you want, all this stuff with that, but it's less demanding. Right. So is there going to be more sets, more movements to be able to compensate for that gap? Or is that gap just being mitigated because the caloric intake and everything going into the show is going down? You, you understand what I'm asking? Oh, no, I do. Yeah. yeah. And I've shifted some thought around this too, and almost like to start moving to these other movements before we even get into prep for, for one that there's a degree of novelty, right? Even when you switch an exercise, you could be a little bit reserved in it. Mm -hmm. And so you might have that a little bit of uh, catch up you need to do just to learn that pat, not learn if you're advanced, you'd be reacclimated, but you do. Yeah. And you, there is a reservation to where you maybe don't get as much stimulus. So I would rather bring this in when we have the caloric surplus to have a degree of adaptation, you to catch up before we dive into like full on prep. Mm -hmm. So some of those movements that could, I know someone could sustain almost rather switch to them before we even dive into prep because I've done it. And you, a lot of guys can uphold those to very, very far in, into a mm -hmm. prep. Usually it's just set reductions along the way to where maybe you have that hip hinge that's just down to like one set now. And maybe it's the last two, three weeks where you actually need to pull it at and what that would look like. Mm -hmm. It could be going to like, some people do better with like a dumbbell or Smith machine RDL. And I wouldn't make up the volume anyway. Um, if someone that's really smashed or I could see like forms getting a little precarious, right? Maybe that is just keeping them on like a glute bridge and a hamstring curl. So we make it up with two lifts to where we get stimulus across those muscle groups, but remove that systemic lo load that would be occurring and fatigue from it. Mm -hmm. So it, it is, it is a little dependent. Uh, but for the most part, I, I wouldn't be making up volume if, if the movement was similar enough. But if I do have to break it apart enough, then yeah, we would have probably two exercises and in, in, uh, an equal amount of sets across it. So that hip hinge, which which got down like one set, well, hey, we do a set of leg curl somewhere in the program and some extra glute work there to, to make it up. Do we need the erector work making up? Now, usually I wouldn't have it in, especially if we're that close to a show. Mm -hmm. so it takes people are surprised how, how little it could take to maintain tissue going into a show. Thanks everyone for tuning in to today's podcast. Are you struggling to hit your peak on show day? Feeling lost in the off season? Upgrade your coaching game with J3 University. Our program covers everything from off season to contest prep to peak week, all based from real client results. Along with our comprehensive physique curriculum, you'll also get access to our four rooms with our J3U team to answer any questions you have and live Q&A sessions to further your coaching and athlete experience. We are the source of education for top IFBB pros and coaches. Join us to elevate the coaching standard at J3 University. Let's get back to today's podcast. All right, guys, if you're anything like me, there's going to be certain times of the year where you're going to suffer from brain fog because either you're working too much or not working enough or your training just sucks and it's not going the way that you want it to go. Merrick Health can help with this. Merrick Health is a premium telehealth platform that focuses on hormone optimization and preventative medicine. AmerrickHealth.com backslash table talk. You look for the guided optimization. You set that up. You'll get 10% off your first order, even if it is just the labs or the guided optimization by using the code table talk all right guys if you're looking for an intra workout field rations by first detachment would be my first choice each serving is packed with a precise amount of carbohydrates amino acids and a sodium complex for optimal performance and it doesn't taste like crap so if you're looking to increase the intensity of your training and to recover better from your training sessions first attachment field rations get field rations today at firstdetachment.com code table talk 10% off your first order. All right guys, this is how I use my element packs. I got a few different ways that I use it. So currently just got done training. So post training, I will mix one of the chocolate. This is the chocolate caramel and my oatmeal. I'm more of a half packet guy. So I'll put about a half a packet in there and then stir it around. Then it adds that salty chocolate taste to it. If for some reason I'm using chocolate protein in my oatmeal, then I won't put that in there. I'll put a half pack in my coffee, which I'm not gonna do now, 
but the chocolate mocha is really good in the coffee. And then for training, <clears throat> when I trained earlier today, it's simply my favorite is the grapefruit salt. Pretty much just a you know a half pack in there, and then kind of reseal the packs, and then put them in, and then so for training, you know, I'll have a half a pack and then half a pack in the oatmeal. So it's about a pack a day. If I'm sweating really bad during training, then I might use a full pack in there. But the go-to for me is the oatmeal because it's an everyday thing. With, um, say, the volume of the training, a contrast here, let's say you have DC training, and then you'll have what John used to do, it, the, his high volume yeah. periods. And, and <clears throat> the cardio like would be manually when I would say Shelby, when I was working with him, it was like DC training, right? So it's not really a whole lot of training time. You know, the stimulus is high, but then the cardio is through the freaking roof, right? Where John's like two hours back, right? Then no cardio, right? So do you see that type of correlation there with the training volume with the cardio? Now, granted, the cardio is still being manipulated on how you're losing to begin yeah. with, right? Um, but is for you, have you found that there's, there's a threshold you want to stay between, you know, because like two hours of cardio is fucking ridiculous, right? I hated doing it, right? So I'd rather have just trained more. <laughs> you, you get what I'm saying? Right. So how, what, where do you sit with that management of that training volume with that cardio? I do segment the most because like, what's our main goal for weight training, right? It's muscle retention. So I'm not trying to use that as a means to just expend calories because then we could lead to just frivolous volume that drives a lot of fatigue yeah and getting to a point of diminishing returns there and what's probably the greatest driver of fatigue in your day it's, it's probably going to be training so to to manage that to a degree uh, but enough stimulus to hold tissue so i i don't base it around trying to have an ex, a caloric expenditure but I'm always keeping volume just within whatever that person's re recovery capacity mm -hmm. is. So I am more of this higher effort trainer that I like pretty close proximity to failure. Now I see failure as a tool, so it's not a training program. So I'm not like we train all the failure all the time, bro. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, no, no one does that. No. Enjoy, your, yeah. enjoy your RDLs <laughs> when you do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's like, uh, and I think it's a learned skill too. As you get mm -hmm. progressive and you hold that form standardized, you're able to take it farther in those reps and not compromise and remove tension off where you want it. Yeah, well, so, just, just the word failure in itself becomes something that needs to be defined. Yes. Right. Because a slower tempo can lead to failure quicker where you can use a slower tempo. And then this is how I kind of explained to some of the power lifters when I'm trying to teach them how to train their accessories like a bodybuilder. Like you're using the slower tempo, you're controlling the weight, full range of motion. And, you know, it, let's say it says 12 reps, but it's six. If you stayed with that same thing, you would probably fail at eight, but you don't. Right. So you start heaving shit cheating yeah. and then you get to the 12 but yet you could have done 15 if you kept going that way right so when people talk about training to failure it's kind of like well, what do you mean you have to you, define you, the first rep yeah. to even give context to the rest of the reps to give context to the failure so yeah that's a mess of a conversation in itself so how do you have that conversation <laughs> right well it's a it's a learning experience over time to where yeah. you take someone right i think at least teaching, I know we're getting way off your yeah, yeah. question here, but at least teaching, I think in your isolation exercises with someone that's a beginner, because you can control a lot of those extra variables of people shifting mechanics around. Mm -hmm. Like if you're doing a, a leg extension, like you have one joint moving, like we could have a, a degree of standardization and take them there. Now they could shorten the range of motion, right? Or move it a little faster. Mm -hmm. But I think there's some teaching points along the way, but as you get more advanced, you're able to take it there farther and keep everything locked into a good degree. So I think you're on a per set basis you get more stimulus but also you have to realize that there's a fatigue cost to it and that's where you have to manage on prep to where we can't i don't think we can have sessions where that are that caloric re robust because the fatigue side is so hard to manage um and that that's when you start moving less throughout the day like we talked about and then it requires now the two hour cardio sessions so my means in like a contest prep is uphold that training performance and do everything to expend calories with the least fatigue cost as possible. So I, I have a baseline of cardio that I like 
from a health standpoint in bodybuilding because of everything we do, like being 250 plus and taking yeah. PDs. This is not a great idea. We should have some degree of cardio for health. So what is that? I think a good, now it's going to be different for everyone based yeah. on their activity, of course, right? Mm -hmm. uh, some guys that do like 20,000 steps a day probably don't need extra cardio on top of it. Uh, so a baseline, we're just talking about this, right? Like five days of 30 minutes of a moderate intensity cardio, getting heart rate up 60 to 70% of your max. Mm -hmm. That isn't preferential for me. Like I'm a little different. What I've found that I like, I do four hit sessions post training uh, for like five sets of one minute, like 80, 90% of effort. Um, with one minute rest intervals. So I like doing like the low volume hit option. Did you have to build up to that though, to build the base, to be able to do that hit effectively? Or was that something that you just kind of fit enough to do from the start? Cause yeah, I, I was fit enough to do it. Okay. Cause I'd say a lot, a lot of bodybuilders or, you know, people who maybe doing their first prep, haven't done any cardio forever. Yeah. And they're like, well, hits way quicker and they're doing hit but what they're doing is really not hit because yeah. they're not even fit enough to do real hit if, if, if you get what i'm saying no i do and and i had i had a basal of cardio there mm -hmm. and then also it, i think it there's a training specificity side to it to bodybuilding mm -hmm. right like how long does a bodybuilding set usually last for it's 60 maybe, 80 seconds yeah, whatever it might be. 30 minutes seconds to maybe mm -hmm. up 60 seconds so that pattern reflects mm -hmm. really well in upholding my work capacity and in, in bodybuilding training um also it's very short duration so the adherence is pretty good to it mm -hmm. and i like to be challenged kind of crazy mentally with mm -hmm. cardio uh versus like this steady state that i just find boring so mm -hmm. um there is a little bit of fatigue side to it i mean how i do i think it's relatively low in fatiguing i mm -hmm. Again, we're getting kind of off here, no, but no. I, I, I like no, doing No, because a, this plays into the strength athletes too, right? It, yeah, because it does. Because they won't do any cardio fitness, then yeah. they're not recovering because they don't have circulation to be able to recover. Because <laughs> eventually, like in off-season, like, well, if I'm doing all this cardio for leg training, it's going to impact my leg training. So how do I manage that? Yeah. And at least with how I did hit is, well, for one, I'm already pretty warmed up general after a training session. I jump on the spin bike, light pedal for a minute, and I hit my first set for a minute. Then I go over to the battle ropes and I hit a set there, mm -hmm. go back to the spin bike, back to the battle ropes, and then finish on one set of spin so bike. There's so there's no high level local fatigue. Right, exactly. I do three sets for a minute on a spin bike. That's all concentric, pedaling, no eccentric. Mm -hmm. Doesn't impact my leg training. Mm -hmm. Then I, I spread out that localized fatigue to some a little bit of upper body work too. You leave the gym with a big delt and quad pump. Everyone wins. <laughs> yeah. Work capacity improves. Well, there's no eccentric with the ropes either. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we're down now. Could you continue that throughout the prep? That was going to be my question now. Yeah. You're probably going to need to transition that out to either mm -hmm. some steady state to replace that or or um, for what works well for me is increasing just step count. And that's been the biggest tool. Like this last prep eventually, like eight weeks out, no cardio left in place. I was just doing 15,000 steps a day. Again, it's a, it's a means to expend calories, very low fatigue cost. Like I'm just walking on a flat mm -hmm. surface is pretty, pretty low energy. Uh, there's not enough stimulus there to create that concurrent, you know, training where it impedes your hypertrophy stimulus. However, if you go walk for like two hours straight outside, mm -hmm. there's a bit yeah. that could be a challenge there. So spreading that out throughout the day, yeah. uh, that's been a, a huge tool to manage fatigue, uphold training performance, and not have to end up being on the two hours of cardio yeah. per mm -hmm. day. Yeah. So, but for some people, that's not going to be the case. They, they might not have the time to do 15,000 steps a day, and they might have a little bit of cardio that needs to take place. So it's just finding what's the lesser evil for that mm -hmm. type of person to uphold the training performance, have enough calorie expenditure, and manage manage the fatigue and let them see out to getting stage mm -hmm. lean. It all sucks at some point, though. You mentioned yeah. about the, the hit there not affecting your training, your leg training, whatever, um, because you recover from it, right? Most people look at that and go, well, I couldn't do that, whatever. But I think they almost look at it the wrong way there. And A, you built up that hit over time. You didn't, you know, however hard you're able to push that hit now, you probably didn't push it that hard on day one, I presume. And then two, would should you not want to be able to do that? Do you, rather looking at it, I cannot do that because I won't recover. Do you not want to look at it? Oh, it'd be good if I could do that and recover because it would probably have all these ben nice benefits that you, you've talked about, you know? And I think that's where it'd be where people have it backwards is like, you should look at it as in you want to have the work capacity to do that. 
how do I get there rather than just going, well, I can't do that because my legs will be fucked for three days or whatever it might be. Yeah. I think how, if you looked in like the literature, how they're defining some of like hit mm -hmm. or I think that if you say it's sit, mm -hmm. if you wanted to call it this way. So it's like sprint interval training mm -hmm. at like above a hundred percent VO two. Right. So mm -hmm. you'd have to eventually you'd fail during it and you'd yes. have to almost catch up. Mm -hmm. That's not what I do. Yeah. So literature wise, it's fine as like low volume hit. So it's less mm -hmm. than 15 minutes in duration, 80 to 90% of heart rate max. So yeah. this is not an all out everything I got sprint. Mm -hmm. That's a little different, but in these papers and research, if low volume hit compared to like a moderate intensity, you can see all the same like cardio metabolic improvements you would doing the longer moderate cardio and more frequency throughout the mm -hmm. day. So as little as like three sessions a week of doing this low volume hit uh, can bring about all those positive metabolic changes, improvements in insulin sensitivity, improvements in cardiac function. Everything you want as a bodybuilder to stay healthy, like in your lab metrics, is there. What ends off season? Guys getting too fat, too low in insulin mm -hmm. sensitivity, and also poor work capacity. So if you can't train efficiently because you're gassed out after your squat, not going to grow as much anymore or if you're like too insulin resistant now you know food's getting more partitioned towards fat well that ends an off season so this is a means to actually make you keep being productive to grow for longer periods of time so don't look at it as it's going to be this detriment it's a it's a thing that should be there and also keeping that flexibility to be able to move through different energy sources right like mm -hmm. if you're a start a prep and things don't move, like you lower calories, you start some cardio up, you're like, this takes a few weeks before everything starts clicking, you feel like you're now burning body fat. It's like, well, why is that? So a lot of times you just haven't had cardio in place for so long to be able to be flexible between these fuel sources and keeping something like that in and challenge yourself in different like low intensity cardios, something really high effort close to max heart rate and having your resistance training gives you all these energy um, systems that you're able to still have the adaptations to. So when we start prep, things kick up right away. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, a huge benefit yeah. as a bodybuilder. Uh, to to also just time management yeah. because most people don't get stage lean. The number one reason is time. Yeah, they overestimate you know mm -hmm. how much yeah. fat they have. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh, yeah. it it helps with that time component where you don't have a lag in yeah. prep. I would say outside of that as well, if all those benefits didn't exist, those wonderful effects of hit, how much better do you feel six months into your off season when your body weight is creeping up to maybe new heights compared to if you weren't doing that hit? And that cardio work. Yeah, I mean, even even now, like I am not the heaviest I've ever mm -hmm. been, but I'm pretty damn close to it. I'm like seven pounds away from my heaviest, mm -hmm. but I have great work capacity. Like I can hit my set of like my squats. Two minutes later, I'm I'm ready to go again. So I feel good. I don't get winded walking up the stairs. Mm -hmm. You know. Or, so how how would you manage that hit if somebody's on a beta blocker to mitigate you know the side effects of the PEDs or whatever else they're taking? Because now the heart rate you know is going to be suppressed. Yeah. So I don't actually go off heart rate when I'm when I'm like yeah. gauging the, this effort level. So I, I just because that's a hard one to do. Like you're when do you hit the heart yeah, rate yeah, target? Yeah. You're like is that after? Is it during? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I'm also going all out. So um, I just go off like an RPE. Mm -hmm. So one out one out, oh, call it one out of ten. Ten being everything I got. I'm looking for like an eight out of ten of effort for it. So just just work hard is the main thing yeah. and then afterwards usually i'll see off my like apple watch like okay on at like i hit around that 80 90 percent heart rate at some point during that and that's how i gauge it i don't try to get overly analytical with programming heart rate during mm -hmm. to make sure i hit the exact yeah. exact moment so that's that's what i would gauge if you're using something like that yeah well it's a, a lot of powerlifter slash bodybuilders are yeah right because that's how they're keeping the blood pressure from going sky high so they can take more, more shit you right. know so it, the, the, i guess the other question there is should that even be necessary in the first place because it's probably indicative of too much shit to begin with yeah so that comes down right to the the needs versus risk yeah of the individual right so when you first start out in this like your your risk should be relatively low mm -hmm. and you haven't seen out what, what even the potential might be to justify taking on more risk but at some point we go there yeah and 
we accept the higher risk because the goal is is his higher and also that's within the need of what you need to mm-hmm. build so uh do you should you be on a blood pressure medication some guys are going to need to beat it because that's within their goal and risk profile um well it's better than not of course yeah <laughs> now is it is it too much shit? Well, hell yeah, it probably is already too yeah, much shit. Yeah, yeah <laughs> but yeah. it just, it is what it is. Like it has to be because that's part part of the goal. And uh, let's be honest, we're not in this to be the, the yeah. safest, healthiest guys. Like now, we're just trying to be huge, super lean, yeah. ridiculous on stage. But um, absolutely, like we should have things in place, whether it's blood pressure management or lipid management or um, blood glucose management, like all those things are now getting talked about now when they weren't before. Exactly, and I think it's important that they're talked about. You know, and Merrick definitely helps with things like that as well. But it, it's become part of the conversation. But I wonder sometimes, yeah. you know, as as this conversation has increased over the years, and you've you've seen how this has gone to where it was avoiding the conversation. I don't want to say people were lying; you just avoided the conversation, right? That's typical of how it was, and the industry had issues with that. So then now the conversation's out there. So now we got kids in high school on trend. Right. And mitigating side effects and all this other stuff because the conversations out there. So it's there's pros and cons, you know, to the whole thing right. where, you know, what you said is it as you move up, you know, that risk benefit ratio obviously is going to tilt, you know, a little bit more in one direction where we all see it tilting in that direction on year two. Right. To they won't be there in year 10. Not because they'd be dead, but their adaptations aren't going to be able to be the same because they're just burning the shit out of everything right from the jump. Yeah, you just need time to build up all the other skill sets that it takes. It takes a long time to be really good at what we do. Uh, still, this day, I go in the gym. I try to figure out how can I get better at doing these exercises and executing them. And I still find ways to learn more. Right, forever student in this. So when you're doing that, how are you gauging? You know, just are you messing with range of motion, different movement patterns, how it tension, like what's going through your brain as you're trying to figure out, can you do this better? Because weight's one thing. Right. Right. And that's where everybody wants to go. Right. So that's an easy conversation. But what are the other metrics that you're using to figure out? Yeah. Well, as you get older, you keep doing this. You're like, what doesn't hurt? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> By default, right? right? Yeah. Right. Well, it's like, okay, that doesn't hurt. Maybe that will be sustainable. So it's yeah. a lot of times it's finding what's going to be sustainable exercises to do. Uh, I've had rotations where like, I love hip hinges. They don't love me and then they're not sustainable. So mm-hmm. I, I don't do those, but no, absolutely. Uh, a so lot- what do you mean by sustainable? Right, right. right. So weeks, you know, it's granted if something hurts from day one, it hurts. Right. But there's some things that you can do. It hurts a little bit. Right. But you think, well, four weeks, there's no way I can keep progressing on this in four weeks and do that. So what do you mean by sustainable? Also, it should be nearly sustainable throughout your whole year. So if you have a pattern that eventually leads to you getting beat up, what's wrong with the pattern? Mm -hmm. There has to be some movement that we could correct or cueing or something around it to where we could work that pattern to improve it. Or it should be something different. So usually by like training block for training block, this could be eight eight to 10 week block you'll start to get niggles or things that are starting to get beat up. And that's when I start looking back through the exercise of what, what am I doing that I need to be changing? So it could be overhead tricep work that I can do for a little bit, but eventually leads to my elbow shot. And then I can't do it at all. So should I even do that to begin with or find a way that I can change the form? That's a little bit more biomechanically friendly. Mm-hmm. So going in the gym, what are the things that I'm looking at? For one, there has to be some subjective degree that we're trying to gauge on what's a quality stimulus to the muscle. And we just saw Mike Isretel on the way here. I think he's given some really good framework around what that might be. So there should be some degree of connection and tension or distortion during your training, maybe some degree of pump that's occurring while you are training that muscle group. And trying to find those things for one, uh, then also movements that cater well to your own mechanics. So if you don't have the ability to get in that machine and use the full range of motion and feels like your wrist kind of binds up during it, is there another exercise pattern that allows you to get the fuller range of motion and also doesn't bind up your wrist all funny. Mm -hmm. And so it's like trying to, trying to find or shift things around to where you can find the exercise that connects well to you, your mechanics, then also gives you that subjective stimulus. 
then through that, are we seeing in a movement where we're able to have the progressive loading occur? So if it's too like pink dumbbell with my pinky up, it's like, well, that's going to be really hard to progress. And maybe I'm trying to execute so so much finesse that it's also taking away from my ability to stabilize and, and output force. Probably should pick a better movement than that. Mm-hmm. So those are a lot of things that kind of go through my mind as going and uh, trying to pick pick apart exercise design. On, on an individual level for, for exercise selection, and where does the ability to feel the target muscle kind of fall into that hierarchy of importance for you? Or would that maybe be different for someone like you who's well-seasoned compared to someone who's just started, for example? Like, where does that fall for you in terms of importance? For the beginner, it would fall on the very low end Mm -hmm. of the spectrum. Uh, A beginner, just that they're not knowledgeable. And I think the best thing you can do with the beginner is teach the skill set, put them in the right positions to where it's going to be really hard for that muscle to not contract and work during that Mm -hmm. movement. It's like if you're you know, in a squat, you have them where their hips are sitting back a little Mm -hmm. bit farther, a little bit less forward knee drift. Like how are your glutes not going to work? Like they have to work Mm -hmm. to a degree, Mm -hmm. right? Maybe like, well, I don't feel my glutes working. And so that's the issue with perception of tension, right? It's like muscles aren't in short positions. It's a little harder to feel Mm -hmm. them like in a squat feeling your glutes contract. So just put them in the right positions and then start teaching them along the way and teaching them that in isolation movements would be key to where they start. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, no, I feel that contract. It's like try to translate it over to comp compound movements. But as you get more advanced and you advance that skill set of connection, and that's where you could really leverage that and and even get more Mm -hmm. out of your sets. And that's when it matters, right? Because the beginner, hey, you have a squat, like, man, a little bit of stimulus, they're going to grow everything pretty Mm -hmm. good. But for a bodybuilder, you might need to get more direct to very intentional. And so it it develops that skill over time. And that's, that's a big component when I'm going in the gym too, is now trying to, how do we further even enhance this connection? And the progression will happen over time. Sometimes I do have to pull back in the, the load and reps to do mm-hmm. so. Uh, but like even area, especially when a lot of guys come to me when they're advanced, like, Hey John, how do I bring up this body part? I've tried everything. Nothing's responding to it. Right. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times it's, it's right. Cueing exercise positioning, and then trying to get some type of mind muscle connection. Yeah. So is that the prerequisite to have muscle hypertrophy and strength? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Um, Is it a component to keep advancing once you're starting to get to the upper echelon? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that should be building up over time. So it's one of those situations that everything that you have to do from the very beginning is like the opposite of what you have to do (laughs) as you get better. Yeah, that's that's at least how I found it. And yeah, it goes back to like we were talking about DC training rest pause. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, I'm just big compound movements, move weight. Yeah, I'll grow. There's going to be some systemic growth, but there's going to be a point where it's going to have to get a little bit more refined, especially when you're seeing body parts that aren't coming up, like my chest yeah. sucked. Yeah. It's like, but I bench a lot. Why is that happening? Oh, yeah. You're cueing like elbows in, like mm-hmm. chest up, like no range of motion out of the pack. Like, no wonder your chest is coming up. So, yeah, you have to keep refining the movements over time. What about <laughs> nutritionally, the off season? Like, how do you approach that? I mean, so the show's over, right? right? So there's many different theories here, right? Show's over, you just eat like a pig and grow as fast as you possibly can <laughs> to take care of the the the, the rebound. fictitious rebound, oh, right? The anabolic. Yeah, yeah, the anabolic rebound of one week to put on 20 pounds sure. of muscle, right? Um, or a slow gradual. And then it, how long should that bringing the caloric intake back to neutral, I guess? How long should that take? And then how do you go into a surplus? Renee, it's, it's six cookies deep and then... Yeah. And the sushi rolls. Well, outside of that, right? So outside, sure? of, outside of day one, right? Or do you manage the day one? The, the longer I've done it, the, the day one is so... It's like a crucial moment. All, and all those weeks start to dissipate as you go through. So a lot of people within their first day could easily add on body fat. It, some people do. Mm-hmm. They do. And you'll see them even a few days later and they already had impacted by that. Some people don't and it doesn't matter. So it's very, of course, of course it's individual. Uh, but my least goal and, and how I view the post-show period is that it, it is still like a recovery period for most. So you're coming at the end of a contest prep where you have accrued a lot of fatigue, if you're a bodybuilder, you've already used a high amount of gear. So there is an, an organ stress present. There's a connective tissue stress present. 
Also, there's going to be a lot of hormones that you aren't only taking that are going to be suppressed degree. Sleep is kind of in the shitter. You're not the best situation to grow, mm-hmm. right? Now, bring fruit up a little bit. Training is going to start moving. And what I mentioned earlier was that training performance is our best guide to drug need. So if we have nutritionally able to drive up progress and you're coming from a state of high PED use with organ stress, this could be a great time to lower gear and recover those systems and let just nutrition drive a lot of that quality training to you get to a point where you have removed a lot of that organ stress and you're in a better body fat position to now really move into your off season from there. So I titrate that up across until I get someone with all those negative prep maladaptations removed. And that's going to vary. So it could be four to eight weeks for just depending on how far past their set point they had to pull down. Like a female that might have to uh, high body fat, that's get really lean. That might take a little longer uh, for the male that stays lean all the time. That might not take as long at all at all. So I rather keep get someone to their start of their off season, the leanest that I can hold them with all those maladaptations removed. And then now that we have gear low, then now we push it up when things are starting to stall and we just keep literally moving up versus the other approach. Some people I've done it too. Mm -hmm. You throw in a a good amount of gear, maybe a little less than you were on prep. Then you have all the food come in and you drive a lot of the, a lot of the progress, which is progress for sure. I think it's a, an expensive progress because you're building stress on top of stress to then leave yourself an off season where now you have to pull gear back and you see a lot of that awesome fullness and body fat comes back on and now recover to then eventually start your off season again. Now, a lot of the gains are probably made within that initial phase. However, there's a big downtime from there on top of that big gain phase that you made that huge weight increase. What's that do to organ stress on top of it? Not only the gear, right? Which is already compromised. It's already compromised. Yeah. yeah. you're, You're jumping up water rate, your blood pressure. What's that do to kidney function? And sure, it's just a few weeks, but we're trying to bodybuild for the next 10, 15 years. Mm-hmm. It's, it's mm-hmm. cumulative stress. So how do we manage that over time? And don't think just what's the next six weeks look like? What's the next year to 10 years look like? So if I'm going to off season where I spread out the gains a little bit and, and, and manage those stress factors a little bit more, I, I like to do it that way. So that's like even this past off season that I've had probably the most productive. Um, and it's just been that same like try trade gear up as you need it to keep gym progress moving Mm -hmm. uh, versus try to take all the gains at once. The issue though, Dave, is the person that can't be regimented and that gains a lot of fat right off the bat, right? Because some other people can be very controlled. So some people might make the argument, well, why don't you leave some, some like drug in to help facilitate that? It's like, well, we should probably be having more of a teaching moment for these clients mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. try to better guard that. But I don't think that also still doesn't justify using more gear and the people that can't keep their you know nutrition side you know intact. Using more gear it, to it, ameliorate, ameliorate bad habits yeah, is not a great policy. It's only it? worse on health, yeah. right? Uh, so but that's more common than not. Yeah. It is more common. It is more common. So I, I think that it still makes it a recovery spot because you're not in a, a mentally – a point to where you can control yourself. So I think the more advanced you get, that'll be lessened because now you can just every day kind of looks the same. It's just prep or off season. Like my off season kind of looks like my prep. It's just, mm-hmm. you know, food volumes change a bit, you know, mm-hmm. um, but for the most part, it's, it's, it's all is all the same, but it keeps it productive. But mm-hmm. those moments post show are essential to where, how you're going to start your off season and then how the next prep is going to be. So a lot of guys gain so much fat in the post-show period that their off-season is nearly a maintenance phase <laughs> until their next prep. And it's like, you're not making a lot of progress. And then they do have their off-season. They end up getting even fatter. It makes the next prep just brutally hard. Mm-hmm. Right? The, wow. the titration approach that you take there, um, I think was you know was almost a given not that long ago. That's kind of how you did things. And then there's right. kind of this camp of like, well, you that that there's no proof that actually that does anything, and that's only good for assessing your tolerance for a, for a compound. And once you know that, you should just jump straight up to it and this. And but I think they're missing the point there because what you're saying is, sure, you could jump up to eight hundred whatever, but 
then how long can you do the sure maybe that's your 95 percent tolerance or, or whatever but how long can you tolerate that for right maybe it's 16 weeks whereas with your approach if we're titrating up yeah maybe we don't make as much gains right now but if our off season lasts 36 weeks or 40 weeks how much do i actually progress then in 40 weeks before as opposed to getting here and being like oh, okay i gotta cut stuff back take a break do a recomp phase you know whatever it might be so i think that's the a good way of framing it that maybe people aren't seeing you know what i mean <laughs> yeah i know some people get really caught up in like the the nuance and minutia mm-hmm. that doesn't quite matter as much like mm-hmm. if we looked at over like a a year of like dose the area under mm-hmm. the curve is this how we're spreading it out a yep. little bit different mm-hmm. and like what i mean by like tight trading up is just as you just need more you, yep. you move the dose up but that could mm-hmm. be held for weeks and mm-hmm. and what does that jump look like right um so i don't mean like every week we're adding 50 million no no i totally get that yeah and so i just just to be clear on that but that also changes like what does the season look like for someone too Mm -hmm. so someone like say myself that the off season is going to be shorter because you're in this olympia circuit um and also you don't have as as much tissue to add on Mm -hmm. you're going to have off season phases where the cycle durations would be a little shorter Mm -hmm. so could you afford this slower titration week by week Mm -hmm. there's no rules here right we're using Mm -hmm. for what we're doing so maybe it is a more aggressive Mm -hmm. uh increase maybe it's a few weeks where we increase up to a peak dose but i think there's still some pretty good rationale for slowly building Mm -hmm. up a little bit versus week one here's three grams yeah good i needed that week one to grow even though it's going to incrementally increase up just because of accumulation of how esters Mm -hmm. work in the body but um yeah, there's there's not quite rules around this. No. I mean, I just think looking at the dosing framework. strategy from what gives me the most successful off season in terms of length and what how much I can progress in that whole time frame as opposed to, well, you know, I know I can tolerate this. I can just jump up to this right now, but sure. where does that stop? You know, do you really make more progress in those twelve weeks than you do in the twenty weeks doing it that way? Perhaps you know, just looking at it as a, a more cumulative, long term project rather than just what gets me a couple of extra pounds right now is a bit short sighted. Yeah, I'd say. And again, we were talking about what ends off seasons. Mm -hmm. right like a lot of guys who get too fat or work capacity drops in training right or sleep turns to shit and recovery is not good or is it health metrics Mm -hmm. right like or some guys just have the blinders on they just don't look at it but that cycle approach where you just drop it all in Mm -hmm. week one and by 10 weeks everything's starting to like appetites shit like Mm -hmm. your systemic organ stress is just high you can't eat anymore it's like i have to pull back because of these things Mm -hmm. it's like well that gives you a way to just try try to like not only titrate up the stimulus to grow, but also manage the stress too. Mm-hmm. So don't use so much gear that you can't yeah. eat, train and sleep. Like those mm-hmm. are priorities to grow. Yeah. But you're right. Like it could extend out the off season longer versus trying to just take it all mm-hmm. in a few weeks. But it takes time for your maturity side to, to realize. And, you know, some of I, this. I think the thing that sums it up best is how often do we hear like, okay, I'm on 400 of this, 400 of this. Uh, all my lifts, if it's power lift or whatever, everything's going up every week. My body weight's creating up. I'm going to go up to 600. And you're kind of like, why? It's like, oh, but because then it will be even better, right? So maybe it won't. Yeah. Maybe that, maybe you'll go straight over your tolerance and feel like shit. Or maybe 400 to 600 only gets you 1% more. Cause you know, it's kind of like a relationship like that, right? At the end of the day, like there's nothing more common than the guy who's like, yeah, it's going great. So more must accelerate the progress way better. Do you know what I mean? Whereas like with your approach, you can be like, no, let's milk this and then milk the next hundred milligrams and milk the next hundred milligrams. And I just think if you want to be in it for long enough to be good, that's probably going to be a better strategy. Well, I would agree. <laughs> and uh, a lot of it's time too, right? Like mm-hmm. even in powerlifting, bodybuilding, it takes years to get good. So for the young guy that wants to throw it all in, they're not really giving themselves the time to improve all the training, nutrition, mm-hmm. and recovery variables. So the next cycle you do, uh, maybe it does go up a little bit mm-hmm. in a dosage. That's justifiable. Mm-hmm. But also you're better at executing all your other skill sets to where you could even get more out of the same mm-hmm. Or you have a little bit more on top of it versus throwing a bunch in right off the bat and it just masks all your poor shitty training and nutrition and sleep to where eventually you get 
wherever you start maxing out, now you have to look back and relearn all your shitty training and nutrition mm-hmm. and stress management. And what do you do with your gear? It's mm-hmm. only at the max versus the other where you've just kind of moved up over time and you've maxed out all your training skill sets high, nutrition mm-hmm. execution is, you have the perfect bodybuilding lifestyle, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and now you still have the dosages to, to work up a bit from there. Yeah. All right now you're moving into the open, right? Yes. So how are you going to navigate that, right? Because now you can add more weight, right? So you, you can push harder, right? Right. Yeah. Just push right. that. So <laughs> how's this change? Everything that you just said, like how's that change now? Because you're to go there, you're going to have to add more mass than what you've had before, right? Unless you're cutting muscle as you're going down, which is probably a possibility as well. Yeah. So um, this past season was like probably going to be my last 212 when i did it and Mm -hmm. hit a show brought food up right and you know gear came up a little bit post show primarily driven through things that i had to keep low for water retention reasons right like a big leveraging agent was growth hormone Mm -hmm. just yeah we'd be transparent here right and so that brought a ton of fullness in for me without any condition loss and then i continued bringing that to that first open show and led to me being like 10 pounds heavier on stage and and, and doing my first open one and, and it went well. So that was kind of my, my gauge of like, do I even fit in this open mm-hmm. category or not? And the look was so much better. Like you can't go back, you know, once you see that, like, <laughs> we just want to get better. It's, yeah. It'd be like, you know, lifting 600 pounds to then go your next pound to me lift 500. Like, yeah. why, why would you do that? Yeah. Like, no, you just keep getting <laughs> yeah. better. So, so now like, how can I really change to keep adding on size? It's like, well, I've, I've been able to be more reserved in my gear usage because of weight class restrictions. And so now there is an increase because I have used a lot of my variables. Like I train is try to do everything to maximize I can and learn more what I can. But again, there has to be a degree of an increase. And so I started, Hey, a 20 to 30% increase in anabolic load is a pretty reasonable starting point. Where'd I come up with that? Oh, well, it's just a fairly reasonable number yeah. to start with, right? Yeah. If you looked at anecdotally, like moving up that amount, it, it could be justifiable. So mm-hmm. um, that's what was done. And I do believe off season is the time to push that. And it takes more to reach new levels of muscularity versus the other approach of use it all in prep and use lower in the off season. I, I find that to be the opposite when you're managing all variables and controlling those well. Um, also, uh, growth hormone's been a, at a higher level too this off season, and that's and that with the environment that we created post show with like this has been one of the more tightly controlled yeah. off seasons where from starting from a very lean point, I took myself to as lean as I can be with taking all those negative prep things that go away, right, and then started this growth phase, and now I've gone I was you know, 224 at that last show. Now I'm like 254 and still very, very lean. So, um, I've, I've made some solid improvements that, uh, should translate to a good open look, but what does it take? Yeah, it does take pushing the envelope a little bit more, but doing all the other things as right as you can, Mm -hmm. you know, to still maximize them. Do you have a ballpark figure in your head then where you want your body weight to get to before you think you're ready then to cut down for your first open show? Well, it's about to happen. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'm about two, three weeks away yep. from like pulling back, mm-hmm. holding this weight for a little bit, bringing gear low, mm-hmm. and then I'll do 16 weeks of prep to the Texas Pro. So I'll do yep. my next open show there. So I think it's the progress that's been made mm-hmm. is worth still bringing to stage yep. um, versus sitting out, mm-hmm. out longer. Uh, and also based on like judging feedback too, they're like, and when you look at what's going on stage now, there's like a big emphasis on like keeping waistlines tight. Like it's not a mass monster era mm-hmm. where waists don't matter. I think the bringing in of classic physique, you have this, the beautiful art and bodybuilding is kind of there, even mm-hmm. in the open classes. Like look at your top three open guys. Like they can all pull vacuums on stage. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. What the hell. <laughs> so the, uh, j- the judge off when I did that Legion uh, show, he's like, don't let your waist blow out trying to get big. He's like, you just need a little bit more overall development, a little bit, and then bring that to stage. Perfect. So that's that's the feedback. So mm-hmm. does that justify like an extra year or two off? Like, no, no. I, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. It's taking maybe that two twenty four stage weight and maybe getting right under two thirty or at two thirty, 
you know, people ask like, Johnny can come back at 250. Like they don't realize <laughs> yeah. how far stage weight goes. Like, <laughs> especially when you're developed already, like yep. if you don't have a lot of muscle, like, yeah, you, you, you should add a lot on, but when you're already developed, like, Hey, a, a pound of muscle on a delt or something like it's, it would be like exploding. So yeah. it goes a long way. And I don't think you realize uh, what some of these open guys are on stage at. It's a lot lighter than what yeah, you yeah. think it is. So like you say, like six or seven pounds, like you take six or seven pounds of like beef mints or whatever, and like kind of pack that <laughs> on top of your muscle yeah. bellies and be like, that's what I grew. You'd be like, oh yeah, shit on stage. That's actually like, damn, you know, it's, it's a, it's a different physique yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah. It can make a, make a big difference. Just going a little bit, even, you know, our current, uh, Mr. Olympia, Derek Lunsford, his Olympia lab. I don't know what he was at this last one, but he was right, right under two thirty. Wow. Um, not 280, not 290, mm -hmm. you know? So it's also how, how's it put together and look? Mm -hmm. So we know we're not getting on stage, getting on scales. So it's just uh, keeping that X frame factor and building that out more. Mm -hmm. So how will you to. keep that waist down so it doesn't blow out? Yeah. So it's for one, not trying to get overly fat in the off season. Oh yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. But, but that's a big part of it. Some guys do the, the dirty bulk and with gear usage, we see more of like you know, transition of visceral adipose tissue. So now you're fighting against more organ and just fat around the organs to keep that waist mm -hmm. in that stretches it out too. Um, then just like compounding with maybe excessive gear usage too, perturbates that more. And so then, uh, the biggest thing that I've, when I, when I was doing that show from 18 to 19, I started doing daily like abdominal vacuums that, changed my waist yeah. substantially. Uh, I went from like, you know, getting on stage and my vacuum was like a flat ab and I like could barely pull my obliques in to where now I can like suck them in hard and really cinch, cinch my waist down. So every moment on stage is thoughtful in keeping your waist tight and you lose a lot of these shots in these transitions where, you know, people judge it off picks, mm -hmm. but man, you can't do that. You need to see it in person. So some of these guys mm -hmm. are, their waist are hanging out when they're moving through shots. The judges hate it you know, and hate it. So, uh, that's being done every day. So I do abdominal contractions, like you're doing an overhead ab and thigh, cinching down your obliques, training your TVA, letting all your ear out into an abdominal vacuum back to an abdominal contraction. So I'll do like 10 sets of those and that'll be sustained. So, so keeping that training in place to where I'm not walking around all off season long, letting it hang out either, which means you have to watch your food. So you can't go eat, you know, super high fiber foods all the time. If you worry about sati issues or just, you know, going too high in calorie surplus to where you do have that distended belly on top of like the visceral fat gain and everything yeah. else to where it stretches your abdominal wall out over time. I saw on your, your Insta post that you, you do the McGill three every day as well. Is that as part of that routine for benefit on show or is that for a back health purpose? That was a back health thing. And I'd be honest, that kind of have tapered off a bit from mm -hmm. that. Um, try some of that prehab and rehab things, they like come and go, right? Like yeah. as you need them, yeah, for sure. come in. So that, that was one when I was trying to, to find like, how do I balance like core, you know, mm -hmm. core overall being yeah. lower back too. So that one, one that has shifted, but still doing like the abdominal training. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now are you guys in prep together? Are you training for any shows or? I am not, but I ha have no plans on competing anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but I do like the whole process of prep and the whole regimen that comes with it. So like, it might sound crazy to some people, but I like prepping alongside him, mm -hmm. even if I'm not getting on stage. So that's what my plan is yeah. this year, at least. Um, uh, I'm having a little mini cut right now, and then I'll do like a 12 week grow phase and he'll be in prep and I'll jump on prep with him. Mm -hmm. So that's my plan. That's a support. That's a supportive <laughs> partner right there. I, I, th I love being on stage. Like I, thrive in it yeah. like everything about it so she's she's opposite mm -hmm. Completely opposite. like you say you hate the stage could you say it going that far i don't love it don't love it, don't <laughs> love it. yeah the anxiety is super high but she yeah. loves training like the daily process yeah and that's why you're good at it though. yeah i mean i love the training i love the even the prep diet all of it just the stage is just 
not really my thing you mm-hmm. know like i can sit there and see him on stage and you can tell on his face like he just loves it i see my videos when i'm on stage and i look like i want to run off mm-hmm. like <laughs> like it's not the same <laughs> but that, that's super common it's the same with you know you see a lot of powerlifters as well like they compete but actually eventually they realize they don't really actually care about competing, the competing it's portion. they're in it for the training and they just did the competing because they thought that was a thing you had to do yeah but it's actually just the day-to-day process part of it that they love mm-hmm. yeah that's exactly it for me you know yeah, a lot of people get into this because they want the stage Mm-hmm. And they want the status and all that, but then they're not sustained because they don't have the daily love of just mm-hmm. training in your dad's workshop, right? With your yeah. drop light, because you just fucking love to train. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's that's why you've been really good. That's why it's hard on me because I'm like, you need to keep competing. You're so good <laughs> at it. So like, mm-hmm. I don't like it. I'm like, okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. What was the inspiration for the J3 University? A lot of it came out for one. It was just my own personal of how do I get better, you know, every day. And how do things work? So if I learned how it worked and the whys behind it, I could better implement it. Eventually, you keep doing that and people ask you questions and you get to teach them about it. Mm-hmm. And then you're, hey, John, can you coach me? You seem like you know some stuff. I'm like, sure, yeah. And so eventually I had some client load and I'm like, man, I keep repeating myself. I need a place where I can just have a database where clients can go and just learn the stuff. So that started me trying to find a web designer that could host some type of platform like that and didn't really have an idea outside of being like this database for client resources, Mm -hmm. went through two different web developers, had some like failed attempts around that, uh, hard to find the right person to match that had money lost and time wasted. So came across the, the right guy, his name's Mark Fox. Um, He's essential to everything that I do. He He's the one that's familiar with uh, Jordan Peters and trained by JP. Mm-hmm. Joe Bennett, the approach yep. coach. Um, Eugene with the Kabuki method, I believe that's how you say yeah. it. Uh, he, he's, he's the one that's been the backbone and structure okay. of all those. So I got with him. I reached out to Jordan. I'm like, hey, Jordan, who do you use for your website? Because you have a great platform. So yeah, Mark Fox. So I got with him. Had the conversation. That's when he's like, "Yeah, it sounds like you're trying to do like almost like this uh, school, almost like for your clients." Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess that's it. He's like, "Well, I think this could be like a business model. Like, why don't we do it like a university?" So actually, Mark was the one that kind of helped guide that mm-hmm. to what it was. That wasn't the intention at first, and started just all right. Let me make a bodybuilding everything I I would want to know in bodybuilding going from. Uh, nutrition to training all these pieces and there wasn't a lot out there i think one of the probably the best resources that i just talking right now comes to mind was uh, scott stevenson's book mm-hmm. on how to be your own bodybuilding mm-hmm. coach what a cool book mm-hmm. uh, scott was i love scott because he's he's a like-minded bodybuilder like me like we, we more thought out and uh wanted something like that but to be able to teach i love teaching it was such a passion for me so I, I took a year and this was during COVID worked out, just recorded all these lectures to put together to lead people like through the process of everything you would need to know from the informational side um, that would then lead to guiding them through off season, prep, peak week, post show to where you can leave having like a good bearing on if you wanted to coach yourself or you're starting to wanting to coach others, where to go from there. Mm-hmm. So it took a year. To, to build out the lectures and film yeah, it all out yeah. and program it all into that site because another side was the whole like programming piece into a, our your own different apps and everything that man i had no clue no clue that's what it was going to take and mm-hmm. even my past web developers had no clue about what i needed from a, a standpoint on a tech side to support that um yeah so mm-hmm. took, that's took that's going to be a never ending project for you though now because <laughs> you know you're going to go back you know we're four years later or whatever now maybe on year five you're going to watch some of those lectures back and go i'm not sure i agree with that anymore I or think you, he, i think he already does yeah that. yeah no, you learn you're constantly evolving as a coach right you, the stuff you write in year one is not what you'd write right. in year 20 so that's going to be like oh well that needs redoing or i need to release a, another module on that or whatever it's going to become you know it's going to be never ending for you yeah, without without Mark, I don't know if I would have ever finished because mm. he was like, John, we need a minimal viable product. 
Like, yeah. Okay. That means you have to finish And this. Yeah. You won't be able to put everything in this course. So you mm -hmm. just need to come out and then we will find it. And actually this year is when I'm going back through to reshoot because I, I see like this beautiful podcast room that you have. I'm sure this wasn't here. It's not how you no. started podcast no. day one. So, no. you know, Renee was my videographer editor. <laughs> yeah. So mm -hmm. I had like a raspy mic that was buzzing, you know, <laughs> or like, Oh, there's some videos where like, oh, no. I would <laughs> yell at the dogs and we missed yeah. it. Like, Hey, no, 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 shut up while I'm, while I'm <laughs> filming. So that was in there too. So audio video quality wasn't there. Then clarity of thought gets better. Mm -hmm. Then also materials that you're like, Oh, you know what? You're right. Like you were saying, I, I should have added this in. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going back through and like, bring up the quality and also people have come up with questions too that you're like oh i didn't really think that that was going to be missed mm -hmm. that i need to now i need to in. interrupt because our lift is here <laughs> oh it is oh okay oh okay. damn okay oh, all we, right we, all right okay that's fine so um where's the best place for people to get a hold of you so we are most active of course on instagram yeah so at john jewett three is my account Oh, what is mine? Roxy K Flex is mine. What is, what is mine? <laughs> uh, were there any topics that you wanted to talk about I didn't bring up? I don't think so. I think the big transition and uh, from powerlifting to bodybuilding and how that's kind of developed over time. Um, my my big thing that I did want to cover is just trying to be more mindful in the bodybuilding approach and don't think being trying to mindful or reducing your risk is making you uh, less optimal towards your goal. And I think that's a connotation that's been labeled onto like some of what I've done or even with J3U that we're the safe bodybuilding and that doesn't lead to progress. And I'll tell you right now, like what I'm doing is not safe. I wouldn't be a bodybuilder, Yeah, but I'm not trying to be a stupid one either. And I think so throughout this, you know, try to educate yourself and build autonomy for yourself because you need to be your own advocate when there's a lot of misuse and abuse of people out there. So we are in an information age, which is great, but also comes with who do you listen to? Mm -hmm. yeah. So find people that align for the goal that you want that have put people on stage like that. So you can't just have the guy that's all textbook, but actually has like proof through results, a result that you align with, but then also has a logical thought too. Mm -hmm. And that can explain what they're doing in a humble manner. So some guys just are challenged and defensive on things. It's likely for a reason that there's just a shallow depth there yeah. and they're not teachers mm -hmm. at heart and you have a good coach. They are teachers at heart and they want to, they want to help you with that humility in their mind too. So, um, yeah, if you're trying to sort through the field of information that's out there and just try to be the best that you can be, keep those in, in mind when you're trying to find true experts in the field that it comes with experience of in the trenches. And I would take that any day over someone that can just recite you know, published studies to me. Mm -hmm. So if you like the bro that has a little bit of a nerdy approach, <laughs> we do have like our J3 university, right? And uh, that's why I'd say, if you want to get closer, more intimate contact me, like J3 university.com. That's where um, I, I have like forums to interact directly with me. We have live streams and then all of our like pre-recorded coursework. And we just released this year, our, our level two physique coach credential. So if they've done like our entry level courses, we want to now become a credentializing agency for physique coaches, um, to kind of lead the industry. So our level level two is all case study based off our clients. That's like the next step. Mm -hmm. You need experience. You have all the information. So we take our clients. It's cool because we go check in by check in, meal by meal. If you're on peak week, like you're shadowing John if he's peaking a client, mm -hmm. and I. Mm -hmm questions will be challenged to you. Like what decision would you make Dave when, you know, this person's looking flat and we need to do what, and you'd make the call and I would give you the correct answers around these to keep developing you as a coach. So, uh, that's what we have now or J3U PC, but like you said, it's never ending. Man. Yeah. <laughs> It'll keep growing, but no, I think we covered a lot of the the topics outside of me, just like yeah. ranting on about J3U. <laughs> or you talked about, you know, a lot of things that from body, from powerlifting that carried over to bodybuilding. So what things from bodybuilding do you think should carry over to powerlifting or th that you would utilize now, you know, so you could go back and be the powerlifter again, right? What things from bodybuilding would you have implemented 
into that powerlifting? I mean, the first thing that clicks right away is still, I was clueless on for when the recovery side back then, I was young. Mm -hmm. So some, some advanced powerlifters are already going to have that dialed in, but there's probably like, I think the disconnect from what you do in the gym to outside the gym is probably a bit more in powerlifting. Mm -hmm. Um, at least from when I was doing oh, it. Yeah. yeah. And so I think translating that over from the bodybuilders of that, Hey, this 24 seven of what you do is going to matter for your performance in the gym. So like prioritizing sleep and even nutrition, almost like a bodybuilder doesn't have to be quite as regimented, but you probably shouldn't be eating pizzas every day. Yeah. <laughs> candy bars. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, remember that article you like mm -hmm. eating candy bars. In oh, the yeah. Way the gym. <laughs> thing. yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So I, I think, shouldn't do that. So you shouldn't do that. So that, cause like, then mm -hmm. you like, you're like, how, how are you going to be a good powerlifter? Well, you probably got to do it for a long period of time. How you can stay healthy for a long period of time? Well, it's, it's managing all the health variable side too. So taking some of the nutrition pieces from bodybuilders. And also now we have, like you mentioned, and we have like companies like Merrick, right? Mm -hmm. That can help with health management for us, like utilize those because that's only going to make you better to sustain like the high level training that we're trying to put out. So I think those things would have, would have carried over as well too. Um, some more of the, you know, I know we're trying to move weight point A to B, but from the bodybuilding worlds where I really learned more about mechanics and thinking about all those aspects, joint angles and setups mm -hmm. and things that I, I didn't know to do in powerlifting. It was just move the weight. Uh, again, I was younger, right? So there's learn, learning points there, but I would have put more focused on that and learning the skill of the movement. Um, I just didn't have the instruction or the knowledge back then and even even know no you can kind of get away with it too you can you know the young you can kind of get away with it but all right i want to thank you guys for coming out you know it's been a pleasure um any final thoughts no just uh thank you so much for having us like again it's i've been following just a fanboy for a second <laughs> <laughs> like you were a huge influence like for me as a powerlifter but also like in our college powerlifting group too like what you've done in the powerlifting industry has been huge and you were like this initial expert that puts out education advice and someone that's been extremely influential to me so thank, thank you. you and it's yeah. it's just an honor to sit across the table from you and share some type of similarity in that no it's been great thank you guys we're done so if you do any kind of poll if you're doing a pull, even if you're pulling through the transverse plane, like a row where you're kind of abducted at 90 degrees, there's still some lats in that. Like you, they still pull on the humerus, right? So if you're doing a row, you pull the arms behind the body, you're going to get the traps, you're going to get the lats. So they're, they're still getting stimulus.